Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. This is episode 322, and I'm going to be talking today with astrologer Diana Rose Harper about the planet Saturn in astrology and what it means and what it signifies. Uh, so, hey, Diana, welcome back to the show. Hey, Chris. It's uh, as always a pleasure to be here. Yes. Um, so, this is, I always say that in my little Saturnian tone, but I'm actually very excited to do this episode with you today. I'm doing it a little bit out of order. Uranus kind of butted ahead in the order of the planets. And I did Uranus with um, Saturn or Uranus with Rick, Rick Levine last month, um, but I thought Saturn would be okay to come a little bit later and to catch up because Saturn is usually very good at having patience and doing things at the appropriate time. Yeah, totally. I also found it funny. It took a little bit of time for us to even settle on a time to right. do this recording. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, but we have a nice Aquarius rising chart today with Saturn in Aquarius and Jupiter in Aquarius on the Ascendant. I learned my lesson from the Uranus episode, and I put Jupiter on the Ascendant instead of Saturn mm -hmm. in all deference to Saturn, um, but sometimes best not to have it exactly on the Ascendant I learned last month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, so for those who are not familiar with this series, I've been doing a series all year where I go into a deep dive on each of the planets in astrology, and we read through some passages from different ancient and modern astrological authors in order to get an understanding for how astrologers have talked about the meaning of the planet in an astrological context over the past 2,000 years. And then we sort of use that uh, those passages and sort of riff on those passages as good jumping off points for further discussion about what the planet means in astrology. Um, we'll also touch on a little bit of some techniques related to Saturn that are Saturn specific in astrology. Uh, but really, the purpose of this episode is really just to get a really deep um, insight into what Saturn means and how to use it within the context of a birth chart, especially. Uh, does mm -hmm. that sound sound good to you? Well, that sounds wonderful. I love talking about Saturn. So, <laughs> yeah. So, what are yeah. maybe we should start there and talking about what are your Saturn credentials for those that are wondering? So far in this episode, I've tried to this series. I've tried to focus on people that have the planet as the ruler of their ascendant, um, mm -hmm. or that have a emphasis on that planet somehow in their chart. Um, so, what do you what do you feel comfortable sharing in terms of that? Yeah. So, um, I am packing with me. A Capricorn ascendant with Saturn in Capricorn in a day chart. Um, it happens to be pretty tightly conjunct Neptune um, and pretty widely conjunct Venus and right across the street from Jupiter in Cancer. So uh, I have a very well supported Saturn. Nice. I would that say. that is a Saturn, a full house, I think, in in poker terms of mm -hmm. Saturn Saturn placements. Yeah. Yeah, okay. for sure. Saturn privilege, I like to say. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you mind if I show that of just those four placements that you have in in your chart? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so here's the chart. Uh, let me see. I believe I did this correctly. Venus, mm -hmm. Saturn, or Venus, Neptune, Saturn in Capricorn, uh, with Capricorn rising and Jupiter in Cancer. Yep, that's me. Perfect. I always, I always forget about uh, the Neptune involvement until I'm really thinking about it, which is such classic Neptune. But yeah, yeah, it was really interesting and subtle seeing that come up in people's Saturn returns when Saturn was going through Capricorn, and people were having their first Saturn returns, and and those Neptune ones were were subtle but distinctive. Especially the more I, I talked to people about them and understood sometimes some of the idealistic context behind the Saturn return in some instances, and in, in some of the more positive manifestations. Yeah, totally, totally. It's um I feel as though my Saturn return experience um highlighted for me both the malefic and benefic qualities of Neptune. Like really it's just chaotic neutral, but in a really um low key under the radar kind of way. So. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um all right, so let me show the diagram that Paula Bellomini made for us that shows the symbol for Saturn in astrology. Which is sort of like it looks like a cross with kind of like a sickle or a swoop down to the right coming off of the cross, which is the traditional more or less symbol for Saturn. Um, in terms of the domiciles and the dignities of Saturn, its uh, traditional domiciles are said to be Capricorn and Aquarius. Those are the two signs that it rules in traditional astrology. 
and the signs opposite to those are said to be Saturn's the signs of Saturn's detriment or what I call antithesis, which are Cancer opposite to Capricorn and Leo, which is opposite to Aquarius. Uh, and then finally, Saturn has its exaltation where it's raised up in the sign of Libra, and it has the sign of its fall or depression in the sign of Aries. So all that's pretty straightforward in terms of you know, just basic astrology stuff and basics of Saturn. Um, here's another diagram that shows for those watching the video version the just the signs of the zodiac and the different signs ruled by the different planets and some of their traditional properties. Um, Saturn being associated with Capricorn, which is cardinal Earth and uh, feminine sign in that traditional breakdown, and uh, Aquarius, which is a fixed air and masculine sign, so has one feminine, one masculine sign, like all of the traditional planets. Um, yeah, so that's pretty straightforward. It's just a baseline, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I really love about the Saturn glyph is um, the fact that it reflects the harvest implement associated with Saturn, which is the scythe. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like a stylized scythe, and I like to tell people that, it's just like keeping in mind that. Saturn is uh, the Reaper, <laughs> right. literally and figuratively. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and some of the significations that we'll get into are contrast of Saturn's significations as the the second quote unquote traditional malefic in our series are directly contrasted with some of the benefic significations given to planets like Jupiter or or Venus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but one of those is like you were said, like um, can can be at least can be things like death and time and reaching the end of time, which I know we'll, we'll come up to or mm -hmm. we'll talk about soon. Yeah, hopefully right. not actually reaching the end of time in this conversation. <laughs> hopefully, we'll we'll see. Uh, we're a little dangerous here. I mean, the Saturn, the Jupiter episode with Sam Reynolds, ironically, was the shortest episode. So, oh, funny. It was only ninety minutes long. So we'll see what we do with this one. Mm hmm. All right, so let me pull up our first excerpt from an ancient astrologer. Um, I think we're going to start with um, Vedius, the second century astrologer Vedius Valens, who wrote his anthology in the, in the city of Alexandria in Egypt in the mid second century. And right at the beginning of it, he gives a list of the significations of the seven traditional planetary bodies. So this is from my translation from my book. Uh, titled Hellenistic Astrology, the Study of Fate and Fortune. Um, and then I'll, I'll read this one and then we can switch off with the other quotes. Mm -hmm. So Valens says, The star of Saturn makes those born under him petty, malicious, having many anxieties, those who bring themselves down, solitary, deceitful, those who conceal their deceit, austere, downcast, those who have a feigned appearance, squalid, clothed in black, Importunate, sullen, miserable, given to seafaring, practicing waterside trades. And he causes depressions, sluggishness, inaction, obstacles in undertakings, long lasting punishments, subversion of matters, secrets, restraints, imprisonment, sorrows, accusations, tears, being orphaned, captivity, exposures. He makes farmers and gardeners because he rules the soil. He also produces hired workers of property, tax collectors, and violent actions. He produces those who acquire great reputation, notable rank, guardianships, the administration of that which belongs to others, and fathers of other people's children. Of substances he rules lead, wood, and stone. Of parts of the body he rules the legs, the knees, the tendons, the watery parts of the body, phlegm, the bladder, the kidneys, and the inner parts that are hidden. Of illnesses, he is indicative of those that arise from coldness and moisture, such as dropsy, pain in the tendons, gout, cough, dysentery, tumors, convulsions. Of disorders, it indicates spirit possession, unnatural lusts, and depravity. He makes those who are unmarried and widowed, orphans and childlessness, he brings about violent deaths by water or by strangulation or through imprisonment or from dysentery, and he causes falls on one's face. He is the star of Nemesis and of the diurnal sect. He is dark brown in color and astringent in taste. 
So that is that is Valens significations of Saturn in the second century. He does have other passages where he's a little bit more indicating some of the constructive things of Saturn, but for the most part, one of the things about ancient authors is that they tend to frame things in terms of extremes. And if a planet is a malefic, they'll tend to focus on initially just outlining all of the most extreme negative significations, whereas if it's a benefic, they'll tend to focus on outlining the most extreme positive significations. And you're supposed to like read between the lines and understand that there's nuances and shades of gray, even though they're not usually presented right there. This is obviously pretty stark, I think, right? Yeah, it's kind of brutal. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of yeah. not not pulling any punches there with, with Saturn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, which, you know, it's one of these things like I, um, one of the things that I like to mention with Saturn whenever I'm talking about the benefits of Saturn is that just because Saturn is and can be like really constructive and supportive, like Saturn also like brings us into an intense, um, awareness of the reality of the harshness of life. Right. Um, and so, you know, that includes like, uh, squalor, you know, it includes misery, it includes depression, it includes sorrow, like all of these things are still parts of human existence. And, um, you know, Mars, Mars brings on the acute things, I would say, and Saturn really speaks to the more chronic aspects of life that are just super challenging, not not the best, <laughs> you know, not the thing that like, if you have like a menu of life experiences, you're probably not opting into the Saturn ones unless you have to. So yeah, that was um, a quote. I'm not sure if I used it in the Mars episode, but it was from Iamblichus, the philosopher from like the third or fourth century. And he was talking about how the um, emanation or the energy that comes from Mars speeds things up. And the the energy of the emanation from Saturn slows things down, and that sometimes this is experienced in a particular way as like hot versus cold or heat versus coldness, um, but also some of those other things that you you were talking about in terms of just like speed versus slowness, and sometimes things that are acute versus things that are sort of protracted or long and drawn out over time. Yeah, totally. You know, so even thinking about. Um, like, you know, a Mars activity is like, you know, sprinting or shooting a gun. It's like, it just happens. Um, whereas something more Saturnian, um, you know, thinking about um, like the process of aging, like you don't get old unless you've been around for a long time. It takes a long time to get old, <laughs> um, but it doesn't take a long time to shoot a gun. So Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Oh yeah, here's the slide. I'm gonna pull that up from Mars just because it's really useful. So from Iamblichus on the mysteries translated by Clark and a few others, it says the emanation deriving from Saturn tends to pull things together, to like pull them together, while that deriving from Mars tends to provoke motion in them. However, at the level of material things, the passive generative receptacle receives the one as rigidity and coldness, and the other as a degree of inflammation exceeding moderation. Mm -hmm. And that was a really common um, idea as well in Ptolemy, where his basic definition of benefic and malefic was that the malefics tend towards extremes of hot and cold or like fast and slow, whereas the benefics tend to be more moderate. And that was Ptolemy's basic definition of what benefic and malefic even meant in some sense. Um, so it's interesting to think about sometimes. So. As we go through, like this Valens one is obviously the most extreme and most depressing, and it's covering things that are definitely parts of life that astrologers, to whatever extent that astrology encapsulates all of life, should be able to talk about. Um, but I should say, since this is early in the episode, that as we go through other quotes, we will start to see some of the more positive and constructive sides of Saturn as well. Yeah, and I just want to bring up um, like one of the things that Sylvie brought up in the Mars episode, which is that um, the malefics aren't just like here's this list of bad things that might happen to you. It's also the people who do the work to alleviate the bad things, right? So if we're talking about you know depression and anxiety, like Saturn can also connect to like psychologists and um, psychotherapists who help people with their depression and anxiety. Um, so. Yeah, that that I think is important to keep in mind um, with the malefics. 
yeah, that more often than not, um, that some difficult placements or quote unquote difficult placements in a chart can indicate helping people that are in difficult situations and doing something that's positive or constructive, even if ultimately, you know, you're working with people that are in trouble, like a, like a doctor at a hospital, you know, or like a, let's say an emergency room. You know, that's a that's a difficult situation. They're they're working with life and death scenarios, and they're working with people who are, you know, have a major issue that they need help with, and that that can be sort of difficult or, or negative in some context. But what the native is actually doing with it is sort of positive or constructive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly, hundred percent. Yeah. All right, so um, let's pull Valens up again and just talk a little bit, or see what, what some of these things that stand out from Valens that sort of are worth dwelling on at this stage as we get to just some core meanings of Saturn. Um, one of the ones you mentioned is time, and I, I know will come up a lot more. Um, as we talk about Saturn, but I know that you wanted to talk about it, and it might be a good one to start with. Is um, Saturn is the furthest visible planet that you can actually see with the naked eye, mm-hmm. and there's something about that that's really crucial in terms of understanding its basic meaning in astrology and um, a sort of tangible component that it has to it that might not be as present once you get to some of the outer planets beyond Saturn, which include you know, for example, like Neptune, which is a very intangible planet, and that's the first one that you definitely cannot see uh, with the naked eye if you don't have a telescope or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Saturn. Saturn is the boundary, um, and in a very tangible way, it's like Saturn is the last visible planet is the boundary of the sensorial world, essentially. Like the the, you know, whether or not seeing things is a touch. It's like a question. It depends on what you think about the mechanics of sight. But um, you know, the 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 fact that our physical senses cannot perceive beyond Saturn in a consistent way. I also think it's like I'm just being reminded of the fact that I believe it's true. This is something that I that Tony Howard mentioned in a talk at UAC, uh, the last UAC, which is um like Saturn is the only planet that doesn't go outside of the bounds. Like doesn't go out of bounds of like the sun's path from a like a planetary perspective, but just like this idea of being bounded, of being like rule following, of being like this is the limit of reality, um, and time for at least our species who perceives time in this like linear fashion, you know, like time is the ultimate um, curtailment of any effort. Right. You know, it's like time is going to be the thing. You know, none of us get out of this life alive. Like, that's something that I think is a very Saturnian perspective. Like, literally, the end of life is death. We don't get out without dying. And so, yeah, it's the ultimate boundary that's true of, of all living things. Even like the universe itself at some point is on a fixed limit of, of you know, the great expansion and great contraction or, or whatever ends up happening. Or let's say, in a more local sense, like our, sun burning out at some fixed point in time in the future. Yeah, exactly. Like everything comes to its limit. And Saturn demarcates that limit with its physical presence as like the the farthest and slowest of the moving the moving stars, the wandering stars. Right. Yeah, so that's partially where that comes from is it is the slowest for thousands of years when we had ancient sky watchers and Astronomer slash astrologers, they would go outside and watch the stars, and they would track down and write down their movements, and sometimes also note if important events happened on Earth at that time that coincided or correlated with those movements. But the five, uh, the traditional planets, you could see them as little bright uh, stars in the night sky that would move sometimes. Like some of them would move against the backdrop of the other stars. And that's how ancient people first figured out that they were actually planets and that they weren't stars because they'd actually move. And that's what the word planet meant in the first place. Right. Um, or at the very least, they were a different category of star, right? They weren't they weren't the immortal, immovable ones, but rather ones that changed over time and like, you know, retrograded. Like they went backwards sometimes and, you know, they have a cyclical pattern that can be um 
aligned with the cyclical, cyclical patternings of individual human lives and city states and nations and empires and weather and all of these different things. Um, right. There were uh, wandering stars was like the Greek mm-hmm. name. Yeah. Um, and I found this p- picture on the NASA website, uh, but just showing what they look like, like what some of the planets actually look like visually if you're looking out on the night sky and having those bright little star looking things that are a little bit bigger and a little bit brighter than most stars. Um, and the fact that they would move over very long periods of time, but just bringing that around, you know, Mercury moves really fast and Venus moves fast, and then Mars is slightly slower, and then Jupiter is even slower, and then Saturn is the slowest of the visible planets. So these notions of slowness, of things that take a very long time to develop, um, which then leads to things like ideas of things that are old or ancient. And through that access point, you really start getting into the high level archetype of what Saturn means. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, and it's also interesting to think, you know, continue with like the visible component, um, you know, of those brighter than a lot of other stars moving celestial objects, Saturn is the dullest uh, in color, right? It has it has like a dinginess to it and it's less loud and it's like twinkling. <laughs> you know, it's not um it's not showing out the way that Venus does whenever Venus is at maximum brightness. It's it's more it literally like visually is more reserved and more somber. And so then we get these connotations of like what are the things in life that are more somber? Like if we're comparing you know, like, you know, recently with both Jupiter and Saturn visible, like super bright, you can compare them, side, you know, being able to compare them side by side. And it's like one of these stars is very peppy and the other one kind of resents being brought to the party. <laughs> um, and so that like austerity and like don't look at me-ness of Saturn is visible just physically looking at it as a celestial object in the sky, which I think is really brilliant. Well, not brilliant, but fascinating. Yeah. Intellectually brilliant. Um, and, and contrast with Mars, which is like this fiery red star um, as, a, as another one. Yeah. So that does bring up some of, and what I thought was probably the fundamental, one of the fundamental distinctions that already started being made in the Mesopotamian tradition before even Hellenistic astrology was that distinction between the so-called benefic and malefic planets, and it probably was partially tied in with that contrast where you can see this contrast between Venus and Jupiter and how they appear in the night sky versus how Mars and Saturn appear in the night sky, and it starts creating a contrast between um, like a, setting up binary opposites of just if something is going to if if you're going to have a planet that signifies something in the world. There should be something that signifies its opposite. So, in order for there to be like life, there also has to be the opposite of life, which would be death. And so, sometimes you get significations of that associated with like Jupiter being associated with life and Saturn being associated with death through a sort of contrast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, anything that, um, how do I put this? You know, if if life and buoyancy and growth and like all of those Jupiterian things exist, um, then the opposites of those, like the things that lead towards death or the consequences of death, like if we think about sorrow and grief, which are definitely Saturnian, um, like under Saturn's purview, you know, it's like that's a consequence of death, of loss, of ending, are these experiences of sorrow and grief and depression, and you know, if greatness and like great stature and wealth and things like that are associated with Jupiter, then Saturn as its foil would then be associated with things like um, being downtrodden or poverty or things like that. You know, thinking about like the squalid appearance, like the richness of like Jupiterian, like, I don't know, like fine woolens and things like that. You know, it's like, okay, so what's what's the opposite of that? Uh, What's the downside? You know, it's like, I don't know, burlap, burlap sacks, you know, turned into tunics. Um, and so just like these extremes over and over again, um, as emphasized by um, both the 
just like the conceptualizations of these planets, but then again, repeated in their visual existence. Right. Uh, so the two of the words I came up with, the contrast of what you were just saying, one of them is like abundance, which is more of a Jupiter thing versus scarcity, which is more of a Saturn thing, or optimism, which is more of a Jupiter thing versus Saturn would be um, pessimism, um, you know, like, which is a really interesting contrast to have because both obviously are, are necessary at different points and you can you can be led astray either way with either of them if it's overdone or if it's inappropriate for the time but there can be like you know a, a good sort of optimism that carries you forward um, through hope but there can also be and then the opposite of that is a pessimism that can hel- hold you back even when you should move forward through fear which is actually another really important saturn signification but then obviously there can also be like optimism that is misplaced that leads it's like you like fantasy yeah that isn't like well grounded or that leads you into making a misstep because you're focusing more on your hopes and wishes rather than focusing on the practical reality of what's tangibly there um versus you know a type of pessimism let's say constructively that's rooted in um, being real- realistic and a-, a correct assessment of what the what the your your chances are of of pulling something off. Yeah, like realism, I think is maybe. Um, I feel like like uh, actionable realism is the perfect like middle ground between the Jupiterian like maybe fantastical optimism and the Saturnian like excessively doer. <laughs> Like pessimism, um, you know, it's like okay, we need to know what's real. That gives us Saturn. Like Saturn is like what actually is tangibly actually present, and then Jupiter is like, well, what's possible given what we have? So there is like a middle ground that's available between the two of them, um, but we kind of need both sides. Like we need to know like what are the downfalls, what are the reasons this might not work. That actually helps making make something more likely to work if you're aware of what the potential pitfalls are. Yeah, and that's a really great um, Saturn signification is that Saturn and people with a prominent Saturn can see the faults in something really well. They can see things that are not working and they can be really hypercritical and have an ability to be critical, which cuts both ways, which can be either constructive or destructive. Um, the constructive version of that is somebody that can be like, a good editor or can see the faults in other people's work and and learn how to either give constructive feedback or to rise above it themselves because they know how others have made mistakes they learn from their own mistakes as well as those of others and then they rise above it and stand out because what they do is avoid those things and present a like a superior product or what have you um the downside can be um a hypercritical Criticalness that can be self defeating and can stop them from doing anything or releasing anything because of um, a fear that it'll never be good enough and sort of getting stuck in that as a as a spiral. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know that also brings up thinking about fear. It's like there's healthy fear and there's unhealthy fear, right? Like fear. Um, Fear in the face of danger, <laughs> you know, like that's going to help you quite a bit. Um, you know, fear. Th- one of the one of the things with Mars, right, is like fearlessness, which can lead to um, taking um, unwise actions with un- like undesirable consequences. Um, but to have a healthy amount of fear mitigates the consequences of um Basically, not honoring the fact that you can die, right? Like the awareness of death is something that actually enhances capacity to live. Right. Um, yeah, so. it can increase your longevity through knowing what the possible pitfalls are, mm-hmm. um, and that, and that can be a very positive thing. Yeah, like I never, I've never like smoked cigarettes because I'm like, why would I shortchange my life to look cool? Mm. You know, like I think that that is that can be that's one tiny example of just like I am afraid of dying young, so I don't smoke cigarettes. (laughs) Yeah, I'm thinking of like a more uh, comic book version of that, which is just like Indiana Jones like walking into a Mm -hmm. temple and like 
um, the first guy that he's with like running ahead of him, and then like arrows being shot into him because he didn't realize that everything was booby trapped ahead of mm-hmm. him. Uh, versus somebody that walks in cautious into a new situation and like surveils the situation before moving forward because they're aware of potential dangers or, or downfalls or what have you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. Meta metaphorically, of course. I don't know if that's like an actual scenario, but um, <laughs> let's just let's just say. Yeah. Um, so so fear. You know, some of the modern astrological texts that I read early on in the twentieth century late 20th century that we'll get to later on in this episode. I can't rem- remember if it was like Noel Till or if it was some other authors like Liz Green, but fear was one of the ones that they really focused on, especially when astrology was going in a more psychological context of Saturn's placement in a person's birth chart indicating an area where they have a lot of fears or reservations about things. And I think there's a way in which that can be true, especially early in a person's life um, sometimes it's something that they learn how to deal with and they overcome and they become stronger as a result of that. Um, but sometimes I think that is true that Saturn's placement can indicate an area where there can be some fears for different reasons surrounding a certain part of a person's life or certain topics. Yeah, totally. And that actually is reminding me, I'm sure this is going to come up in at least some of the the quotes that we read, but the idea of mastery and what encourages moving towards mastery, because that's another concept that you know, Saturn gets connected to. Um, and even just thinking about like in this Valens quote, um, where was it? I just lost it. He produces those who acquire great reputation, notable rank, right? And like, you know, that great reputation and notable rank, like what's the spur for that? From a Saturnian perspective, I think the motivation is this like, um, I'm afraid of this, or I don't understand this, and not understanding this puts me in some position of risk. And so I'm going to do what I can to comprehend the like the shape of this aspect of reality at the greatest degree possible, and that results in mastery. And in the right context, mastery is also like if it's if it's seen right, if it's appreciated by others, then that mastery leads to great reputation. Yeah, definitely. It's because Saturn doesn't rush into things. It does things very slowly and very deliberately. And some of that is when that's applied to like learning and education, it can be the person who really applies themselves and takes their time to fully learn how to become the best at something and how to excel or, or, um, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, not exceed, but become like the top at something through long hours spent training and practicing and <clears throat> and also making mistakes that's actually one of the biggest thing i think that saturn sometimes does or is it it knows sometimes it when it's working well is sometimes making mistakes and learning from your mistakes and then in, like incorporating that into your knowledge as part of mastery of having like made a bunch of mistakes and knowing what they are and having learned from them as opposed to you know, repeating the same mistakes over and over again or something. Right. And that brings up another like word that I love to associate with Saturn, which is consequences. Like when you know the consequences of doing it wrong and you understand why you don't want those consequences and you understand why those consequences emerged, that facilitates a depth of like, I don't know, it's like a strengthening of the foundations of your knowledge, which just further perpetuates that path towards mastery. Um, and I would say, you know, Saturn is not necessarily like work really hard so that other people admire you. I think Saturn is often like work really hard so you understand this thing. And if other people happen to be like, wow, that's great, I guess. But it's not like I would say like Saturn's Saturn's goal is not necessarily um, appreciation, but um, substance. Mm. Yeah, um, I it makes me think of like because there, there's all sorts of instances of like mastery, and I like on YouTube videos like channels that show people that have become masters in certain fields. Like there was this woman in Japan who specialized in, and she had learned part of a lineage of like bonsai trees and like how to make bonsai trees and how it's like this process that takes years and decades. To learn and and how to to create one and to like mold it and see it grow through time and to be very patient and 
Um, you know, it's something that some of those trees live multiple human lifetimes. So it's like she was like taking care of trees that somebody had started in like the 1800s. Um, but things like that in terms of excelling through like long periods of a lifelong study of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also like bonsai, I think is like a really perfect Saturnian um, thing because like part of the process of bonsai is restricting deliberately restricting the growth and the movement of growth of trees that would be huge if they were not so specifically contained. Um, yeah, that's there's a really beautiful, um, so like I'm in like Southern California and there's the Huntington Gardens and they have like a, an area with a whole bunch of bonsai and like some of their bonsai are like, I think the oldest one that I remember seeing was like 500 years old. Wow. Yeah, just incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. And yeah, so restricting things and also like pruning like certain mm -hmm. branches like before they grow and being able to anticipate things like that. It's really interesting practice. Yeah. Yeah. So there's lots of other things like that, like um, you know, different fields or different specializations in terms of people trying to attain mastery. Like it makes me think of um like Vincent van Gogh a little bit and how much he toiled during the course of his lifetime to like become a better painter and, and teach himself how to paint and how to excel and how to learn from other masters. And maybe that's actually tied into it is the student teacher relationship and the notice of the notion of like apprenticeship and lineage and other things are very sort of like Saturnian type themes as well. Yeah, yeah. I was actually just thinking about this earlier because I'm planning on getting a tattoo next year. <laughs> nice. Um and um I was just one of the things that I've I'm doing to prepare for this tattoo because it's on like a larger part of my body is I'm I'm um doing work to um support the health of my connective tissue. Like even though there's several months before I'm going to get this tattoo, um like when your connective tissue is healthy, um my theory is that uh receiving a tattoo is less painful. Um, and Saturn is connected to the connective tissue, but also tattooing is one of the um, industries that's still really tied in with this concept of apprenticeship as part of the process of becoming a professional tattooer. Um, and I was just thinking about how interesting it is. It's like you, you go to a tattoo artist who has apprenticed and then, you know, the best tattoo artists are really good because they've put a lot of hours into their craft um, in order to endure pain for some amount of time so that you can have a permanent piece of art on your skin. Um, and the skin is, um, the, is a, a Saturnian organ. It is the boundary of the physical body. Um, and so just like how Saturnian overall tattooing is. Um, and then when we add in the the fact that, you know, in contemporary times, this is less the case, but, you know, as recently as 20 years ago, being really tattooed would mark you as an outsider, right? To be visibly tattooed, like you're not trying to fit into the center of things. Um, and marginalization is another Saturnian thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, the apprenticeship component is really interesting. And just thinking about, um, what forms of uh, work in the world like kind of require a relationship with an elder in the same field? Mm. Elders also being Saturnian. Yeah, elders, older people, and that's a funny ancient like traditional signification. Is like sometimes when Saturn's involved in delineations, they'll say it involves somebody that's older. Mm -hmm. um, like if it's a, I'm trying to think of different scenarios. Usually, it's it comes through like house placements or something like that, or or Venus Saturn combinations. They'll say uh, the person will have a relationship with somebody who is older than them, mm -hmm. or the person will have um, a relationship where it'll there'll be delays, but it'll happen later in life or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I actually have that story myself. Like right before my Saturn return, I was dating someone that was like 14 years older than I was. Mm, right. So. Yeah, that's a really common yeah. thing that I see, like um, age disparities when Saturn's involved with either Venus or with um, seventh house placements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's go back to Valens and just see if we're missing things. I mean, he starts mentioning things like depression, uh, which is interesting because psychologically, that's obviously the opposite of like optimism. Um, 
and I guess we've we've talked a little bit about that, but like like skepticism, depression. There's like a cluster of com of um, concepts right there that that's probably important to understand in terms of Saturn. Yeah, I mean, if we think about um, what encourage a per- encourages a person to life versus what encourages or discourages a person from um, like the vibrancy of life, like I, that's one way to think about like these Saturnian significations of like depression, malaise, melancholy, um, like I don't know, um, like the like the the taste of life dissipating in some way, um, like an experience of anhedonia, like a time period where like pleasure isn't really available. And so everything kind of takes on a gray tone, like none of your favorite things are very interesting. Food is boring, you know, whatever, whatever access to like, Ooh, yay. Savory life thing is like not present. Um, you know, that's like, that's, that's a Saturnian experience. Yeah. You know? And also a contrast. There's a little bit of contrast that comes through in the domicile scheme of contrasting um, the two luminaries as the two lights with Saturn in the sign opposite to that as a planet that's signifying um, like darkness and the contrast between the moon and the sun being assigned to the two signs at the the height of the summer in the northern hemisphere versus Saturn being assigned to the two signs. That are in the dead of winter, just after the winter solstice, which are Capricorn and Aquarius in like December and January. And we still have some of that in like our language when we talk about, um, you know, a person has a bright future ahead of them. We mean like an optimistic future versus sometimes um, when a person's in a depressed place, we might say that they're feeling. Um, like things look really dark right now in terms of just the outlook or in terms of things looking like bleak in some sense. Mm-hmm. Or even like someone going down a dark path. You know, like we can see that someone is like moving in a direction that might be self destructive um, or destructive to others. And we'll like use that language of lightness and darkness, um, which speaks really clearly to like the, you know, like humans as primates are extremely reliant upon sight. Right, like I remember learning this, and like I took a, um, I took some classes in like primate evolution in college, um, and one of the most fascinating things that I've held on to um, is this idea that in terms of primates, um, humans swat some of their sense of smell for improved sense of sight. Right, so like pheromones matter less to humans in terms of like different kinds of social interaction, but visuals matter a lot. And we're diurnal creatures, right? Like most people, I mean, night owls are a thing, but night owls are dependent on forms of light, like candles or, you know, electricity or whatever. Um, You know, like visual, like visible is safe, like visible is like to be able to perceive it through the visual faculty is to be able to understand it. And we even use the language of sight in so many different areas of just like, oh, yeah, I see. Like somebody's explaining something to you. And when you get it, you're like, oh, I see it now. Hmm, right. Right. Even though you're not seeing it, you're hearing it and it's like being put together in your noggin. And so, like, a bright future is like, I can see what's there and it seems safe and passable, right? Like, this is a road that I understand for the most part, like where I'm going and what I'm walking on. Whereas like darkness, it's like, I can't, like I have to rely on other senses that are um, less attuned to, um, or like less strong in the species. Um, You know, it's like, there are of course stories of people who lose their sight or who are never sighted, who like navigate the world just fine. But for someone who is used to sight, the loss of sight can be really terrifying. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, especially in comparison to like I think about uh, other animals that have other senses that are more strong, like that dogs can have have a sense of smell that's much mm-hmm. more heightened compared to like humans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And like from what we understand of dog sight, like they don't have the same um, visual spectrum that we do. Mm. Oh, right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, we're getting to some of the stuff in with Saturn that has to do with things like that and things like um, contrasts of light and dark. Um, There's, he does mention like austere, which is kind of an interesting and funny like Saturn signification that is still very relevant and that does come up a lot. The idea of like austerity 
And at least if you're going to contrast, you know, uh, core Saturn significations versus other planets, I think Saturn would be the most austere of of them. Yeah, austere, reserved, um, reticent. Mm. I feel like um, would also be appropriate. And there's this sense of preservation, like preservation of energy, preservation of money, preservation of attention. Um, and then we think about preservation in terms of aging, like aging well, to be mm -hmm. well preserved, um, also means not expending unnecessarily. Mm, right. right. Being very um, strategic in one's like energy or other types of expenditures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm even thinking about, um, like, for some reason, uh, actually, I know why. So, this chair that I'm sitting on, <laughs> this is a 1920s reproduction of the Chippendale chair. Um, nice. I love antiques. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I oh, love yeah. Antiques, old stuff. that's a good Saturn yeah. signification. Oh, totally. But just like thinking about like the sturdiness of a, of a chair like this, it's like there's integrity in the materials that mean that it's not weakening it's not dissolving over time it's preserved it is austere in terms of its um like releasing of the sort of innate qualities that it has whereas something that's made out of like i don't know um like wicker like wicker lawn furniture um if it's not like sealed or whatever if it's not painted like it literally rots <laughs> in your yard um, it, which is a way it's like it's releasing its constituents into the world through the rotting process. Whereas a chair like this is very austere in terms of releasing its constituents. And that's what allows it to be preserved over time. That's really great. That brings up two things. One of them is that it's interesting that Saturn has that dual nature, is that it can signify either one is either the thing that gets better with age um, or. Or, and in some instances, valued more because of its age and antiquity, but also it can signify sometimes those things that are um, falling apart due to age and they're old and sort of like decrepit or or what have you. Yeah, it's like again the consequences, like the consequences of age. Like for some objects, the consequences of age is like no longer useful, needs to just go in the compost heap. Whereas for other things, like the consequence of age is like, wow, this is amazing. And I think that's, it brings up another thing, which is I think over time, that's how you understand actually the qualities of something. Um, and like not to say that something that lasts a long time is qualitatively better or superior than something else. Like we need stuff to rot, you know, it's like if it weren't for compost, we, you know, or inorganic fertilizers, whatever, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't have food to eat. Um, and like our digestion process is essentially a controlled rot process that allows our bodies to derive nutrients from stuff. Like we need stuff to break down. Um, but to, like that understanding of something's qualities over time, that's very Saturnian. Yeah. I'm thinking about it. it keeps this thing that keeps coming up with me in this series over the past several months, and the contrast between the benefics and malefics, which was a very ancient core concept, but I think of Aristotle's concept of generation versus corruption or coming into being versus passing away. And it seems like the benefics are very much on the side of the generation or the coming into being, the things that are being built up and increasing versus the malefics are, are signifying or representing those things that are um, either corrupting or passing away in some sense. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And like you know, that also just brings up it's like we can't have life without death, and we can't have death without life. Like these things are um, irrevocably fused together. I actually just read, um, reread. I thought I hadn't read it before. Turns out I had, um, but I just reread Ursula K. Le Guin's *The Farthest Shore*, which is uh, part of the Earth Sea cycle, um, and. It brings up this this villain um, who shows up in at least one other of the Earth Sea novels, um, whose villainy is because of this attempt to elude death, to like like achieve some form of eternal life by getting away from death. Um, and like spoiler alert, sorry, um, but it's relevant for the conversation. Like the consequence of this this villain's pursuit of eternal life is a form of existence that doesn't have any of the savor of life and is literally just destroying the world 
at the same time. Like there's no there's no benefit <laughs> to the evasion of death, but death having this like, you know, very necessary role to play in terms of people actually experiencing aliveness in a substantive and meaningful fashion. Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And just in terms of the natural cycle, even with um, let's say trees of, you know, in the spring and the summer, you know, they sprout leaves and it grows and becomes kind of vibrant. And then eventually in the fall, the leaves start to fall off and then they start to decay and go back into the ground. And then eventually the cycle starts over again. Yeah. And the decay of those leaves that have fallen, whenever those things are, you know, they're taken apart by bugs and bacteria and fungi, and the nutrients in those leaves that have fallen are reuptaken by the roots of those trees to become new leaves. Like, <laughs> it's amazing. So I think that's really important because this that's a concept that comes up a few times. And I tried exploring it in a lecture I gave a few months ago at Norwalk, but it's a really subtle concept that's hidden in Hellenistic astrology where they sometimes talk about um the Saturn placement and malefics in general, when they're well placed in the person's chart, indicating um, benefits to the native at the expense of others. Mm, and I mm -hmm. think that's kind of underlying that core component. Because if you think about it, it's like the tree's losing its leaves, which just let, let's say for the sake of argument, the tree is like a, a sentient being. It's probably not super happy, let's say, about losing its leaves, but then the bugs and and other plants and stuff sort of end up feeding on that in some sense, and it and it ends up benefiting them at the cost or the expense of of the tree. Um, there's other probably better analogies that I could use of that sort of cycle, but that's like a necessary cycle in nature. Yeah, and then you know we extend that cycle beyond just that, like step one, step two, like tree true tree loses leaves, uh, bugs, bacteria at all get a nice hearty meal. And then because those creatures have done their work of breaking things down, there are now nutrients available for that same tree and also trees in the local neighborhood, right? So there is a cyclicity to it. So it's like the labor of the bugs and the bacteria and the fungi benefit the tree, right? So it's like the loss of energy, like the effort made by the bugs and bacteria, et cetera, feeding the tree. And so like inside of a cyclical system, that like gain at the expense of others ultimately goes back to those others if it's like a healthy system, which, you know, in ecology, it's a lot easier to kind of see those systems and process like the nitrogen cycle or the oxygen cycle or the water cycle or like all of these like circular, ultimately circular processes. Um, it's harder to see inside of systems where linearity has been imposed over circularity. Mm. Right, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to find really quickly if I could find like a translation of Antiochus that has that passage, but I don't think I will be able to. Um, yeah, so maybe we can sort of skip that point. But there's just there's both constructive versions of that of benefiting at the expense of somebody else, and there's also destructive versions of that, mm -hmm. which are like. Either let's say predatory, or you know that which is a term that has a lot of connotations now, but it also just in terms of like actual predators in nature, mm -hmm. let's say, yeah. um, or or animals that survive by eating other animals, for example, would be an example of something that is, uh, you know, one thing benefiting at the expense of another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And there's no circularity, at least within that tiny or like not tiny, but like individual interaction, right? Like lion attacks antelope, lion and friends eat antelope. That specific antelope is not going to come back <laughs> and derive benefits from having been eaten by lions. But the remains of that antelope will fertilize the ground there and grow like grasses that other antelopes are going to come eat. Right. Um, but it's like less that circularity is less present on like the individual scale, right? So we think about something like predatory lending or um like greed or you know, Valens talks about deception, right? Deceit and to like deceive someone um 
is to prioritize your own benefit over honesty with another individual. Um, and sometimes that deception is like literally what allows you to survive, right? Like there are situations where, um, you know, like it is, it is necessary for your continuance in order to like, like you have to maybe lie about something just to like get through a situation unscathed. But then there are situations where it's just like, I didn't feel like being honest and now I have a gajillion dollars. Like, like I just watched the, the Lula Rich documentary series recently where there was definitely like a lot of untruths happening and a lot of people making a lot of money at the expense of a whole lot of other people, like a pyramid scheme would I think it'd be a really good example of benefiting at the expense of others in a non-cyclical fashion. Right. So. Like a multi-level marketing scheme or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really important. Just that comes up and is much more prominent in ancient astrologers, um, how the malefics and Saturn get contrasted as indicating deception because they're being contrasted with benefics like Jupiter is indicating truth and like bringing bringing light to things versus the opposite like making something dark or, or mysterious that's something that we're going to see we see shift in the modern times where for example Neptune often gets more of the like deception mm -hmm. um, significations in modern astrology but it, it's a useful thing to keep in mind from some of the traditional texts some of those notions of of, of deception yeah, like literally occulting, and Saturn gets associated with the occult in general as well. And like thinking about deception and the occult, it's like there's also a relationship between Saturn and Mercury. Mercury is also a trickster, but the tricksterness of Mercury is often more like he he he, I stole your harp, Apollo, right. um, versus the um, more like spooky, scary deception that gets associated with Saturn. Right. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Um, other things we have to bring up, one of them that I'm seeing here in Valens is just notions of restraints and imprisonment, I think are really important, like things that are restrained or held back or, um, yeah, because metaphorically there's a lot of different, like sometimes metaphorical ways that that can manifest of being metaphorically restrained, but also there can be very literal manifestations of that as well, like being in like handcuffs or being thrown in, in jail or prison. Mm -hmm. And that actually brings up some of the significations that Saturn has um, in the context of the houses, where in the traditional astrological scheme, Saturn is said to um, have its joy or to rejoice in the twelfth house, which in the ancient Hellenistic tradition was called the place of bad spirit, and the twelfth was primarily associated with things like enemies, sickness, loss, and seclusion, which are all sort of Saturnian type significations as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting thinking about constriction, containment, um, and like the extremes of that, which, like as you've mentioned, the ancient authors will pretty much. Priority, prioritize the extreme right. significations, right? But, you know, to be extremely contained is like, you know, handcuffed and like attached to a chain to a wall and like a terrible prison. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, like right now I'm envisioning like the debtors' prisons from like England and like the 1700s or whatever, just like terrible places. Right. Um, but containment is also, you know, like I was mentioning earlier, like our skin is functionally like the beauty of the skin is venusian but the function of the skin is saturnian mm. um it contains it makes us not just like weird blobs of like organs and like yeah. muscles just like flapping around <laughs> yeah so. it holds our largely like liquid bodies like together mm -hmm. yeah and you know we can even see that in the uh, Capricorn Cancer axis, where it's like Capricorn, I often say is like the bowl and Cancer is the milk. Like you can't, you're not going to drink. I mean, you can lick sh milk right off the table if you have to, but the table is still Saturnian. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Um, well, that reminds me of, of course, one of the most striking components of Saturn, uh, which is its rings, it being the primary ringed planet in the solar system, which ancient astrologers didn't know necessarily. They could only just see that it was this little slow-moving dim star, 
But eventually, once telescopes were invented, and especially once we started flying, you know, uh, spacecraft out there with NASA um, and taking pictures like this one, which comes from NASA or comes from maybe the Hubble telescope, uh, you could see that Saturn has these really beautiful rings around it, which invokes a lot of interesting metaphors that are kind of, on the one hand, tied in with some of these notions of like like restraint or things like that. Yeah, containment. Yeah. You know, even thinking about like handcuffs essentially make circles. Yeah, or even like a, a wedding ring, uh, which is a, a ring that goes on your finger. But one of the things mm -hmm. that it is is almost like a, a promissory notion of of being um, in an agreement to be permanently like together in a relationship. Yeah, I mean they're like tiny, tiny finger shackles without the chain, <laughs> right. or with only with a conceptual chain rather than a physical chain. Okay, that's very yeah. rom romantic. Um, on, you, <laughs> I mean, it depends know. depends on your proclivities, I think. <laughs> sure, right. Yeah, just, just messing yeah. with you. Um, um, yeah, but yeah, just like this idea of um, like like even thinking about boundedness, like to be bounded, um, like bondage, being you know just like this idea of being um, like I'm thinking of this in terms of like the enslavement comp like capacity of bondage and just. To have your freedom, um, uh, not under your control, right? Yeah, curtailed, or to give power mm -hmm. over to somebody else, or even to, to just have power. Your to have your power taken away, even. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like the ultimate, like, like the ultimate, like. I just keep coming back to death as like the literal and metaphorical, like thing that you cannot control and that curtails your freedom of movement in some mm -hmm. way um, or freedom of expression or freedom of being. Yeah. Um, and that's funny. Sometimes those that, that have power and don't have those kinds of restraints being um, attracted to or secretly attracted to uh, being put in a situation where they are restrained uh, in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is interesting to think about how ultimate freedom is like i mean for me at least uh more terrifying than the awareness that there are limits as to what can be done mm -hmm. um you know and even just thinking about lawlessness right this idea of lawlessness which um you know like the like especially the the chaos image of just like you know there are no like um there are no like straight up like governmental laws but then maybe there are also no social laws either mm. um like there's no there's no restrictions on uh people's impulses um and how that feels really terrifying because of this awareness that um there's a lot of violence contained in aspects of human expression um you know they're like humans like as a species have done some like ridiculously terrible things and you know the restrictions of morality and ethics and social expectation plus the restrictions to a degree of like the legal structure like those are all things that um contain chaos even as they also like literally speaking curtail freedom Right. Like if we understand freedom to just be doing whatever the hell you want, regardless of the consequences, mm -hmm. um, versus an idea of freedom that um, deeply integrates an idea of responsibility within it as well. Yeah, I love that. That's a really good point. And just the idea of boundaries, I keep coming back to in this conversation, the idea of boundaries and thinking about Saturn and just thinking about like standing on a beach and taking a stick and just drawing a circle around you. Uh, 360 degrees and saying like these are my boundaries and uh, saying to somebody else you are not allowed to step um, on this side of that once you've mm -hmm. established what that boundary is it's like a mm -hmm. it is just a, it, in some ways it's an imaginary circle but there's different ways in life in which each of us has boundaries that we set up that are either explicit or implicit um, mm -hmm. but they nonetheless are very important in terms of sometimes when you transgress those things or go outside of the boundaries that's when you get into trouble or there can be problems yeah totally and you know it just reminds me um Jessica Lignadu has a, 
often said something along the lines, I'm not going to be able to quote perfectly, but something like the long, along the lines of like boundaries are what give both of us space to love each other. Mm. Right. Like understanding, like if you're drawing a boundary, you're like, this is the space that is my space. Right. Or like, these are the things that are acceptable. And that's like a claiming of a certain kind of literal or metaphorical territory. Mm. She's like, this is the room I need. <laughs> and that's a really good, because it's another um, Capricorn rising, Saturn ruled astrologer. So that's a perfect statement coming from a Saturn mm -hmm. person, another Saturn yeah. person. Yeah. I love, like, even though we practice astrology in very different ways, like, I agree with her on so many things. And it's probably because of that. So mm, that makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Saturn in relationships, the positive side of boundaries. Um, is there anything else? Let me pull Valens up again. I feel like we're getting into a lot of good stuff. This, there's many more digressions and good directions that yeah. we're going. So I know we have to move on it. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to touch on is, um, you know, he makes farmers and gardeners because he rules the soil. And right. this idea of, uh, like, one of the things that I like to talk about um, sometimes in client sessions is this idea that, you know, Saturn, Kronos, like, has these historical associations with agriculture. It's like this image of Saturn as the reaper. It's not just the reaping of souls, right? It's like literally out in the fields, like, reaping the harvest of grain. Right. Um, and this idea of, like, you know, the wealth of your, or like the, the consequences of your efforts in collaboration with reality being this like wealth of, you know, whether it's like actual like cash money or the things that you sell for cash money, like wheat <laughs> um, in an agricultural sense, but like to, to reap what you have sown, like that mm -hmm. is such a Saturnian phrase and concept. And it has these very literal um, ties to agriculturalism. Yeah, um, I love that because you just because you have to take it through the whole idea of what a farmer does and like planting the mm -hmm. seed and then tending to it and watering it and then and being patient, patience, <laughs> yeah, over like yeah. a long period of time and then mm -hmm. eventually when the time is right, when it's reached that perfect moment of maturity or or whatever the plant, then knowing exactly when it's time to to harvest it. Mm -hmm. And farming or gardening, like, requires a lot of understanding what you have control over and what you don't. Like, you can't control the weather. <laughs> you know, you cannot dictate whether or not there's a hailstorm, a hailstorm that comes right before it's time to harvest, like, your super tender tomatoes. Um, that's this, like, this idea that, um, like, I don't know, the universe has its own sort of uh, humor, that's sometimes very mean humor, almost. But that's like a disappointing experience to be like, I was so close to being ready to harvest this thing. And then it was like, there's a loss experience. But then, you know, you get lucky enough with the weather, and you're patient enough, you end up having a bountiful harvest, you know, and gardening and agriculture both have vast amounts of um like skills to master um you know especially if you are doing so in an environment that's challenging for whatever combination of reasons it's like thinking about i don't know companion planting and fertilizing and um you know timing your seedlings and navigating pests and you know, if you're selling these things, like how do you get them to market? How do you get customers? Like there's just a massive amount of things to know in order to be a successful farmer or gardener. Yeah, totally. And um, that word you keep using of consequences being such a good Saturnian term, it makes me think of a side note of where in late 20th century astrology, Saturn started being associated with more and more, especially by more new age inclined astrologers with the concept of karma. And I always had a little bit of an issue with that in that I don't think there's just like one thing in a chart that, to whatever extent the concept of karma exists, I don't think there's one thing in a chart that indicates it. And in like Indian astrology, like the entire chart to some extent is the result of one's karma or karmic actions from the past or past lives. But understanding, if we just understand karma in terms of like consequences of past actions, whatever that means, I think that's a much more interesting like access point for understanding what Saturn indicates sometimes and that idea that you you said of like reaping what you sow. 
Yeah, totally. Especially if you can divorce your concept of conse consequences from the only punitive angle, right? Like I think, you know, concepts of consequences and discipline, which are both very Saturnian, like inside of um, a cultural context that for a very large combination of reasons tends towards um, this concept of punition instead of just results, um, or even accountability, like that can be, it can be challenging to find language to use here. And I think that's actually part of why um, the idea of karma kind of came in. Um, I just, you know, I also don't really use the language of karma because it's not relevant inside of the spiritual practices that I engage in. Um, and because I personally, it's, like I, I perceive and then have a hard time completely dissociating um, karma from the concepts of sin, right? Just because of like my early, ex early exposures to the ideas of karma were definitely kind of like using a new language for an old idea of sin and the problems of sin and like, you know, being damned to hell forever kind of thing versus um, simply just consequences. Yeah. Um, and there's some access point there. I always remember one of my teachers from Project Hindsight, Robert Schmidt, um, pointed out that in the Greek, ancient Greek astrologers, they used the term, the tenth house was said to signify proxis, which means action. And that he noted that in Sanskrit, the word karma originally, that was partially just what karma meant was action. And mm. so it's like the, the result mm -hmm. of actions, but the 10th house is the place of actions and the place of where you initiate action, but also then became the place of what one does. And that phrase that we, we have today of, of when you ask somebody, you know, what do you do? You're asking them what their profession is, but in some broader sense, you know, what their profession is, is just what they do in the world in, in some broader way. Yeah. Like what's your, like that's, that actually, like I almost, um, I feel like in the wrong context, it would be insufferable to be this person, but like to have that opening of being like, hey, what's your proxis? Instead of <laughs> right. like, hey, what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So I think that's pretty good for Valens. So we can move on. Um, something I was just thinking about before we jump to Abu Mashar is just going back to that theme that I keep dwelling on over the past few months of Saturn slowing things down and you know, sometimes that leads to what is the ultimate slowness, but death itself. Like that's when, um, you know, life and everything else comes to a stop, is when it slows down permanently. So Saturn slows things down, but it also brings about the cessation of things, um, which then also leads to another Saturn signification sometimes, which can be endings. And sometimes this comes up, for example, with Saturn transits, like seeing when it will transit through a certain house. It can slow things down in that house or in that part of your life. Um, or in some instances, the slowing down can be like the ultimate slowing down of bringing something to an end. Yeah, bring something to a close. Yeah, and it's interesting. This is one of the things, like even just talking about what do the malefics have um, in common with each other and what do the benefics have in common with each other. And it's like both of the malefics. Um, have this like ending aspect to them. Um, but like the Mars ending often feels more violent or more abrupt, um, more sudden, like that speed component that you were talking about earlier. Because it's also like a, a severing or a separation type thing, a cutting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just like there's a, it was, and now it's no longer in a very um, intense way. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas, um, with Saturn, it's, it feels, um, more like, of course it's done now. Right. Like it's, there's like, it's like a completion versus a utter destruction. Yeah. Like, let's say mm -hmm. we're talking about seventh house and relationships, which mm -hmm. is like an experience everyone goes through at some point. But like one of your things you were saying, I think in the keyword is like abruptness for Mars, that mm -hmm. Mars is more abrupt, whereas Sometimes like a Saturn seventh house transit can be finally calling it quits and realizing a relationship has run its entire course and now it's mm -hmm. time to, you know, the the accumulated things over years of those, let's say, signals have built up and now it's it's time to to leave. 
so that Mm -hmm. it's something that was like long and coming or something that Mm -hmm. may not be super abrupt. It may be like a process of getting out of it that lasts even a year or two or three, but there's still Mm -hmm. this um, realization of the accumulation of past actions and consequences that have added up Mm -hmm. to indicate that it's time to end something. Yeah, yeah, it's like the the breakup where you're just like, I mean, I knew this was going to happen like 3 years ago. Right. It just wasn't time yet. You're just hanging like, in there. Mhm. Whereas, yeah. you know, the the Mars breakup can be like, I thought everything was great. Right. Like, what? And uh, but at the same time, it can be a different kind of ending if we're thinking about the 7th house, right? Like a Saturn transit through the 7th house can look like, you know, if other factors are moving in this direction, it's like the end of a non-committed relationship, which is to say the beginning of commitment Mm -hmm. in a more substantive way, whether that's like, okay, cool, we're going to move in together or we're going to get married. Um, You know, so even that sense of, um, you know, going back to what we were saying before of like wedding rings is like tiny shackles without a physical chain between them of just being like, cool, we're going to lock this down. Like actually that was something I was thinking about um, for some reason, I was remembering this burger joint that used to exist in Chicago called The Lockdown, which was like a prison themed, like metal music burger bar. Okay. <laughs> um, but like lockdown as like a Saturn word to lock something down um, to like. Yeah, or to lock it in. Yeah, or to lock it in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, locks. Locks are Saturnian. Yeah. And clocks, which is just a lock with a C at the front, right? Like that's also Saturnian. Okay. I like that. If there's one yeah. tagline for this, that'll be the tagline for this episode. That <laughs> clocks are just locks with C's on the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I like that. I like where this is going. Um, okay. So slowing things down, bringing endings mm-hmm. to things wrapping them up, but also on the flip side, as you were saying, sometimes um, putting a permanent commitment on something and entering mm-hmm. into like a formal agreement or or trying to um, create a foundation for something so that it will be more permanent and long lasting mm-hmm. and a, a sort of initiating a, a sort of promise in some sense that it will be something that will last long into the future. Yeah. Endurance to be like, okay, we've maybe done some stress testing on this and we've proven that it's thus far durable let's like lock it in and see how durable it actually is phrase that comes to mind is uh that it stands the test of time Uh uh-huh yeah totally totally very saturnian yeah and for some reason that's reminding me of like a tale as old as time like the disney song oh yeah total side note but yeah what um was that from like Fievel or what was that from? No, I think um, it's, oh heck, Tale as Old as Time. Oh no, Beauty and the Beast. Is that Beauty and the Beast? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Which oh, is man. funny because that one also has like a literal animated clock character. Right. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <Saturnian. laughs> uh, wow. I like that. Uh, yeah. I'm a little disappointed in my like Disney knowledge. Like 10 year old me is like severely disappointed right now, but um, at least it came up with it. So that's, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. All right. So let's go to our second astrologer. So their first one was Vedius Valens, and we're talking about very early in the Western astrological tradition with the Hellenistic tradition. Now we're going to jump forward several centuries to Abu Mashar and his text, The Great Introduction, which was written in Baghdad probably around the middle of the ninth century. And this translation is from Benjamin Dykes. Um, do you feel okay reading it? It's actually two part. It's kind of long because Abu Mashar was famously very wordy, so it's on two slides. Yeah, I mean, was that just him showing off at how much paper he could buy? Because like, I mean, some later astrologers complained about it. Like, I think because mm-hmm. he did the greater introduction, and then he also did the lesser introduction, where it's like super short and concise. And um, I finally got the text of Al Kabisi, who I think was like a century later after Abu Mashar, and he. Thought that like the greater introduction was way too long and the shorter introduction was way too short, so he tried to write <laughs> something in between, mm-hmm. and that's what Al Kabisi's introduction to astrology mm-hmm. is, and it ended up becoming really popular in Europe because it sort of hit that sweet spot right in the middle. Yeah, mm. yeah. Malefics and benefics yet again. <laughs> yes, extreme yeah. extremes. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm good to read it. So okay. <clears throat> 
As for Saturn, his nature is cooling, drying, black bile, dark, harsh, and coarseness. But sometimes it is cooling and wet, heavy, stinking air. And he is of much eating, sincere in his affection, and indicates works of moisture, plowing, farming, the masters of villages, the cultivation of lands, building, waters and rivers, the appraising of things, the apportioning of lands, wealth and an abundance of assets, those working with their hands and avarice, harsh poverty, lowly people, travel on the seas, a long absence from the homeland, and distant bad journeys, and delusion, malice, resentment, cunning, stratagems, deception, treachery, harm, anguish, solitude, and little company with people, putting on airs, lack of restraint, haughtiness, conceit, boasting, those who enslave the people, managers for the sultan, and every work done with evil, coercion, injustice, and anger, and fighters, chains, confinement, the stocks, and imposing restrictions, and sincerity of speech, deliberateness, being unhurried, understanding, tested actions, examination, stubbornness, much thought, profundity, insistence, sticking to a single path, hardly ever getting angry, but if he did get angry, he would not be able to control himself, not loving the good for anyone. And he indicates old men and the weighty among people, fear, hardships, anxieties, sorrows, dejection, confusion, complications, difficulty, adversity, restriction, the ancestors, the dead, inheritances, lamentation, orphanhood, old things, grandfathers, fathers, older brothers, slaves, stable workers, misers, people who have a bad reputation, disgraced people, robbers, gravediggers, murder, murderers? Murder, murdoches? What are these? Uh, right after gravediggers? Murdoches. I don't know what that murdoches. means. It's almost like Ben like forgot to translate one Arabic term or Okay. I'll Google it later. Okay, cool. Uh body snatchers, <laughs> um, tanners, people who make things faulty, sorcerers, masters of social unrest, the riffraff, eunuchs, long thought but little speech the knowledge of secrets, and no one knows what is in his soul, nor does he disclose it to anyone, being acquainted with every abstruse matter, and it indicates leading an ascetic life and the devout people of religious communities. Nice. Yeah. That is a lot. So, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit, obviously, there's some continuation of some things that we saw in Valens. Um, there's some additional negative and terrible significations, but then I, f I feel like he, he does a little bit more than Valens did to indicate or include some of the more constructive significations as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and even seeing some of the things that we were talking about before in terms of, you know, wealth and abundance, um, you know, materiality. Um, some of these things are really interesting because they're not things I would personally associate with Saturn. Um, in terms of just like straight up Saturnian expression, um, but more more of the things that um, you know I would think would maybe come about if somebody was deficient mm. in Saturn, like much eating. Like I consider that to be the opposite of um, the sort of austerity we were talking about before. Um, yeah, yeah. But, there's a, there's yeah. a lot of tricky things that have to do with um, you know. Are we talking? Uh, in some instances, implicit thing here is that we're talking about like a dignified Saturn uh, for constructive things, or we're talking about a, a poorly placed Saturn for negative things. There's other things that are weird or context specific, like he says, mm -hmm. the managers for the Sultan, which is really you know interesting because we're talking about like ninth century, one hundred and one Arabian Nights, like Baghdad time frame when we're talking about this, and just in terms of the cultural relativity of astrology during whatever period we're talking about. Um, we also run into issues with all of these <clears throat> older texts, which I got a firsthand experience with with Valens. And if you read my book, I put 
a million footnotes under almost every signification mm -hmm. because there's a level of interpretation where the word in ancient Greek or here in ancient Arabic may mean you know five or 10 different things and the translator mm -hmm. sort of goes with the one that they think is the most correct but there may be other a range of other meanings that um could be better or that the author could actually mean or if you were living in like ninth century society you would understand better why they picked that signification or what have you right like even thinking about connotations right like a given word's connotation can change vastly over time like at one point I started writing an essay that I've never shared about them, the judgment card in tarot. Um, and judgment as a negative thing is a connotational component that's not um, within the original definition of the term. Same thing with doom. To meet mm. your doom was not was like the same as meeting your destiny. But with okay. now we have like this connotation that doom is terrible and destiny is amazing. Mm. Um, but in the original like senses of those words, they're both neutral. Okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of tricky stuff like that when it comes mm -hmm. to things like this and especially looking at historical things. We're going to gloss over most of that for the most part, mm -hmm. um, but it's something people do have to it's be aware of. It's worth keeping in mind. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, all right, so let's pull up uh, what were some of the things well, one of the things that came up, he didn't use this word exactly, but somewhere in one of these significations, one of the terms that it brought up to me was um, gravitas, like people that have gra gravitas. Um, maybe it was some of the later ones. He starts talking about sincerity of speech, but especially deliberateness, like Saturn is very deliberate, being unhurried, like being slow to do something, but being very deliberate and like doing it at your own time. It sort of reminds me of um in like Lord of the Rings, uh tree beard and like some mm -hmm. of the trees that like move very slowly and uh some of the like dialogue about that. Yeah, I actually think that's a wonderful metaphor because even thinking about um, you know, this this thing that Abu Mashar is saying, uh, hardly ever getting angry, but if he did get angry, he would be un he would be not he would not be able to control himself. Um, or that's exactly what happens with the ants. Like the ants are like, you know what? It's not a problem. That's over there. Those are for those people. We're over here. And then they like witness the destruct that the destruction that Sauron has been wreaking, and they just go bananas. They like right. destroy everything, <laughs> like pulling down dams and like you know, like literally just throwing orcs left and right. It's incredible. Right. Um, yeah, that's actually a really great metaphor, Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wish I could remember yeah. the exact quote. If like Becca or if Becca Tarnas or Joe Gleason were here, they could tell me the exact quote from mm -hmm. like Tree Beard. But I'm sure somebody can can mention it in the comments. Don't be so hasty is something that you know. Not so hasty is the thing that Tree Beard says like repeatedly. Yeah. And then there was some other thing about like anything worth doing is worth doing. I don't know if that's actually a quote or I'm getting anything that from worth something. saying is worth taking your time to say is like the gist of one of the things that uh, Treebird says also. That's it. So that's mm -hmm. what some of this stuff down here is reminding me of understanding, um, examination, much thought, profundity, like those who are of few words or, or don't necessarily talk a lot, but when they do, you know, it's saying something that is more profound. Um, and doing it in a shorter amount of words. That's what, you know, in like the next slide, you know, when um, Abu Mushar says long thought, but little speech. And then this, you know, the knowledge of secrets, but no one knows what's in his soul because he's not saying it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, yeah. And, you know, even like, and the weighty, you know, I wonder at that, uh, that word there, I don't know the Arabic at all, but I wonder like the weighty, does that mean like people who have a lot of body mass or is that the weighty in the sense of gravitas that you were just bringing up? Yeah. Um, and right after that, being acquainted with every obtruse matter makes me think also of like, you know, we mentioned occult previously because occult originally meant um, like hidden or, or dark in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. But, but now it's come to mean sort of something else, but that's part of the reason why it ha has that connotation. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, aesthetic also, it says this, those lead, who lead an aesthetic life is a very Saturnian thing. Yeah. I mean, that brings up the austerity thing from 
from Valens, right? Right. Of, you know, asceticism being like an extreme austerity in terms of what you consider um, necessary or desirable, or like not even necessarily desirable, but what do you consider necessary and permissible, mm. right? Sometimes I think Saturn is more concerned with what is okay than what is amazing. Right? Yeah, and also just like what do you need at the bare minimum to survive and that being mm -hmm. sufficient and not needing some of the other finer things in life or other things that are not absolutely necessary to live. Yeah, exactly. Like even, you know, what does it mean to find um like access to um if not joy, then like not completely despondent. Um without needing um the the excesses of jupiter or the um like sen sensorial pleasures of venus mm -hmm. um so yeah yeah uh somebody on twitter i saw yesterday they had a tweet where they said ven or jupiter is quantity and venus is quality and mm -hmm. it makes me think of that because there is a contrast there, as you were just saying, with Saturn, mm -hmm. with sometimes more is less, uh, or less less is more in a sense, mm -hmm. um, as being a Saturn type type thing. Yeah, like in a in a contemporary sense, I would say that minimalism mm. as a, like a lifestyle would definitely be Saturnian. Right, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, let me go back to. This, um, I mean, it is talking about there is a digression I have to make. Uh, you know, he says um, old things, which includes when he starts getting into people like grandfathers, fathers, older brothers, um, and so on. There is a whole, it's been an ongoing thing about Saturn for years on the astrology podcast, where I think it was Charlie Obert found a quote in Dorotheus where it says Dor that it said that. Saturn was feminine, which is different from the rest of the astrologers trad traditionally that uh, where Saturn was a masculine said to be a masculine planet or indicate masculine figures. And there's been an ongoing like question then of, you know, because it would have been interesting because it would have created a more symmetrical scheme if Saturn was feminine, Mars was masculine, uh, and so on and other so forth with the other planets like Venus feminine, what have you. And um, textually, that the version of the Dorotheus text that we have today does make that one reference, but we're not sure if it's just an error in the received Arabic text, which is like three times removed from its original language. We do know that at least one later astrologer, Theophilus, in like the eighth century, had access to that Arabic text and read it and took that to heart, and therefore himself treated Saturn as feminine because he thought Dorotheus did. But it's not clear if Dorotheus in the original text actually did, or if that's just a mistake in the Arabic text that was passed on. So I just wanted to like footnote that since this is the official Saturn episode, and say that's basically the state of that research, and that's probably as far as that'll ever go. And different people can draw different conclusions or or whatever just based on that. But that's basically as much as we know about that. Yeah, I I personally find it really um, great to think about. Uh, Saturn from like a like a feminine perspective, like a grandmother rather than a grandfather, um, you know. And one thing that I think about when it comes to this kind of thing too is, you know, what like is is Saturn in a given person's chart placed in a diurnal or nocturnal sign, like a feminine or a masculine sign, and how does that um, influence access to Saturn through either this like grandmotherly lens or a grandfatherly lens? And you know, for me, Saturn and Capricorn, that's, you know, Earth sign. So that's the like nocturnal or feminine expression of Saturn. And um it's also then interesting to think about how that opens up the doorway for um, you know, people who maybe don't want to only refer to Greco-Roman mythology um as the planets have been named for, but want access to other traditions. Um you know, in terms of myths and legends and like cultural touchstones, like to think about um, Saturn as feminine really opens 
opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of that kind of connection. So like the Kalyak from um, like Celtic, Celtic lands, um, you know, or, you know, a lot of this, a lot of people who will relate Saturn uh, to the concept of karma will also relate Saturn to the deity Kali, um, you know, may or may not be like culturally accurate, um, but there are definitely overlaps in terms of significations um, and meaning making that is available there. So, yeah, yeah, and I, I think Rick and I had a long discussion about this in the Uranus episode because there was a issue where it didn't seem like to me that mythology was the primary access point for the astrologers understanding the significations of the new planets when it came to Uranus and Neptune, and then it increasingly started becoming more and more important when you come to Pluto and then recently the asteroids and things like that. But historically, it was interesting because it's partially due to the presumption that that's always been the case. The mythology has always been the primary access point, and so there's like an ongoing question about um, whether mythology now, if there's newly discovered bodies, should be the primary access point, or if we should be accessing it somehow through an empirical lens or some sort of empir- like some other conceptual approach or what have you. Um, one thing I have thought of since that episode that's really interesting is that's different compared to the modern times is that in modern times, the outer planets have been named by astronomers. And while sometimes they have like cute little reasons for that, or there's little motivations that are kind of interesting. Much of the time, there's not necessarily. And that's actually different compared to the ancient planets because the Greek astrologers, at least let's just say limited to the Western tradition, um, there was a point before when the, the planets had not been attributed names of the gods, and the Greeks like referred to them with different like descriptive names for the planets, the wandering stars. But there was like a specific point in time where somebody in the Greek tradition um, saw what the planets were, what gods they were associated with in the in the Mesopotamian tradition, and then named the planets after that by picking the corresponding deity that corresponded to that in the Greek tradition. So there was more of a deliberateness, I think, at that point to find the correct corresponding god, and I think that's why we start running into issues in modern times, like with Uranus, where. Um, it wasn't done necessarily deliberately or for mythological or, or conceptual reasons, but um, that might be why there's some disconnect sometimes with astrologers like Richard Tarnas, who argue that like the Prometheus myth is a better representation of what Uranus actually signifies in astrology than the Uranus myth is, for example. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Like I. Like I was listening, I haven't listened to the entirety of the Uranus episode yet, but I remember like I was listening to that section. And I was thinking that it is really interesting um, considering the role of um like like one way to think about deities is they're kind of like um collection points for archetypal symbology or like archetypal expression. Um and um like how like if we can think about archetypes as potentially having some level of agency in terms of like getting noticed or expressed um you know i don't think that operates entirely well for uranus and neptune i think it's somewhat functional for pluto um and like in my own research when it comes to the asteroids it's partially relevant right it's not 100 and, it's not 100% all of the time um but it is interesting to then think about um like doing that deliberate work maybe similar to that greek astrologer that looked at the mesopotamian names for the planets and was like oh what if we do it with our gods um you know to be doing that effort um as like a contemporary person like maybe say looking at saturn and like not just looking at saturn the mythological figure but saturn as it functions astrologically um like what are those significations and then Relating that to, um, you know, cultural touchstones, whether those be um, deities or legendary figures, or even, um, you know, like one of the things that I will have uh, my one-on-one students do is like watch TV, like rewatch their favorite television show, and like identify characters with the planets, 
Um, like all of these are different ways of like finding names for archetypal clusters. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause some, or some like movies or even some of like the, like the Marvel movies and stuff are mm -hmm. expressing like archetypes that are some of our modern day myths and things like that. Or when mm -hmm. somebody mentions like some of the philosophical themes in like the matrix, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, we are talking about deeper level um, archetypal themes in the same way that that you would in ancient times in terms of telling some of these myths and some of these stories. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I just wanted to mention that in passing as part of an ongoing thing and something I was thinking about, about the deliberateness of the ancient assignments. Um, oh, and, and, but also like the gender thing. I think we started with, oh, yeah. you know, like Saturn having like a, a feminine like a feminine expression um, right. or potentially being um, overall considered to be a feminine planet versus a masculine planet. Yeah. And I think the answer is just do whatever you want because there's mm -hmm. maybe there, there is an overwhelmingly long tradition of it being masculine. And at least in the Greek tradition, like Kronos was a masculine figure. So there's probably a tendency for the Greek astrologers and then even Going forward into the Arabic tradition, here we can see with Abu Mashar to treat Saturn as masculine, but um, I think there's enough, uh, not mutability, but um, what's the term for something that's ma malleability that mm -hmm. you know you could also treat it like the, the grandmotherly figure mm -hmm. um, or, or the older woman with wisdom, I think is just as much of an appropriate metaphor or symbol to use as yeah. well. Yeah, one one uh, approach to that, if you do want to stay inside of like the Greek named figures, Hecate mm. is a really um, Saturnian figure. Um, and for for folks who are just like, I want to try to think about Saturn, but for whatever reason, like Sky Granddaddy is not doing it for me. Mm. Like that's an option. Yeah. Okay. Um, and. I mean, I guess the the way that this is even practically relevant in ancient times is more just like they were looking for significators that would indicate when there were questions when gender was relevant, like whether it would be mm -hmm. a male or a female figure. And sometimes the Saturn stuff does get incorporated into things like indicating the father or the lot of father incorporates mm -hmm. Saturn, for example. So um, I don't want to get into all of that, but that's just one of the areas where sometimes those gender things were more concretely relevant for for different reasons. Yeah, like technical, there are technical reasons for that. Yeah. yeah. Um whereas we can have a much broader discussion about the malleability of some of those placements and archetypes when we're talking about it in like a psychological context or other other contexts. Mhm. Mm yeah. All right. So, back to Abu Mashar and anything that we need to talk about or dwell on when it comes to some of the significations that he gave. Um, um, one thing. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say one word that's jumping out at me is this concept of coercion, um, and in part because, like, I think about coercion as a um, you're kind of hurting, like H E R D, hurting someone into um, a particular way of being or a way of acting, um, and you know, that, that idea of like, that also I think ties in with like deception or treachery, even, um, stratagems, cunning, like all of these ideas of like, what does it mean to have an idea of what your, what you desire, what your, what the will is, like what is to be accomplished, um, and using the methods available to you to make that happen, um, maybe without other people's full onboard consent. Um, and, you know, that the image of herding for me is like, you know, the activity of boundarying something, but in movement, like in motion. Um, and so I think that's, that's kind of a, it's an interesting concept to think about, like, what is the, like, there's the idea of the boundary as a wall, it's like a static thing, but then what does it mean to have like a like a a boundary or a barrier in motion? Um, so that was one thing that was coming up. Okay, well, that makes me think of going back to something I 
thought about after the Mars episode because what always happens is like we talk for three hours and then we end and then like five minutes later you think of twenty great great things that you wanted to say. So one of them was like um, I was watching some like YouTube video that was talking about some of the geopolitical stuff with like war and. Um, things like that, and it was talking about war as being like a projection of force and um, attempts to impose your like will on somebody. And it was like invoking Mars type things for me in terms of <clears throat> you know that being something, let's say, countries or something do in order to get things that they want or get people to do things that they want. And as you're mentioning some of those things about hurting, to me, it's Invoking similar thoughts about um, the same thing of trying to like get what you want or get others to do what you want, but in a more more in line with some of the manipulating type tendencies that are being mentioned here with Saturn. And when you're talking about hurting and stuff, it's also making me think of what you might do if you were hurting, let's say, um, a bunch of like goats or something. Is one of the things that you do is use. Boundaries to your advantage by, like, um, you know, if you have a fence on one side and a fence on another, and it's like you're um, hurting them into a specific direction by using the natural boundaries that are there to your advantage in some sense. And maybe that's part of where some of that is going. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, like creating boundaries, but then also, yeah, using the boundaries that are available, like even thinking about something like coercion. Um, uh, just thinking again about like that Lula Rich documentary series that I watched recently. And, um, you know, this idea of like kind of coercing people into like X, Y, or Z. And it's just like you, you use like a combination of social pressures and financial pressures and um, like everybody else is doing it. Why aren't you like that kind of thing? And that's a form of coercion of just being like, here are these other boundaries. Like people want to be included. People want to be, beautiful, people want to be successful. And then I have this thing that I want you to do, and I'm going to use these other things to get you to do what I want you to do. And then when you were just talking about like, like the imposition of will, where it's like maybe the Mars way of doing that is war, like then thinking about something like embargoes as maybe a Saturnian perspective of just being like, we're going to limit or put, put really high, um, yeah, basically you just put limitations in terms of what you can do economically. And that is kind it's a it's a cold a cold version of warfare, not like cold war, but like a like a not not propulsive form of warfare, but rather a um to remove something from someone, to take away something as a form of um political manipulation. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um and I think Valens used the phrase like compulsory actions and it's like raising ideas of how how somebody can be compelled to do something that they don't want to which is a very saturnian type thing sometimes that makes you think of like obligations and duties and things that you have to do but also um here with abu mashar when he's he puts those three together of he says every work done with evil coercion and injustice it makes me think of the way that sometimes like a a bad guy or like a villain or like a mafia person might coerce somebody to do something through like let's say blackmail or something like having something that you're holding over somebody's head which you're using in order to force them to do something that they might not do otherwise yeah totally, totally. yeah so um all right so back to this and if there's anything else we need to talk about in Abu Mashar before we move on to our next author um, there's nothing that's like jumping out at me at this yeah. point. I mean, the only other thing I'll mention, because he mentions it again in Valence did too, towards the top, he says, and it indicates works of moisture. Um, and especially in the Greek tradition, less so as the tradition goes on, but like waterside trades and like water things were sometimes mentioned in connection with, mm. with Saturn. Mm -hmm. That actually reminds me when I was reading through this, one of the things that a thought that came up was this idea that water is a natural border. Um, and that, um, you know, like a river or a lake or an ocean um, are very obvious demarcations of like, this is land here and there's land over there. <laughs> um, 
And like, because I was like, why is water keep coming up with Saturn? Um, but I think it might also be then tied to the fact that, um, like foreigners from like really far places, there's a high likelihood that they enter into a place via water or their first entry into a new country is in a water place because of ports um, and trade, like the intensity of um, like merchant activity um, in in harbors, um, like at boundary points, essentially at water-based boundary points. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And there's there may be some other like additional metaphorical things. It's just such an interesting contrast because we tend to think of Saturn as more earthy, really, and, and dry, and dry. Um, but you know, in some of the ancient authors associating with like um, sailors and water things is a common motif that comes up. Like especially in, for example, like things like indications for violent death. Valens will say if they have a Mars indication for violent death, that means like dying in a fire but if they have a saturn indication then it can mean like drowning for example um and and some of this may be coming from earlier mesopotamian traditions where for example in there was some legend from berosus from the mesopotamian tradition of this notion that when all of the um, planets are aligned in cancer that the world would be destroyed by a fire whereas with it, when they were all aligned in in capricorn that the world would be destroyed by a flood um, so it may be partially derived from some of those older things, and yeah, there's lots of other reasons. Well, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, whole other topic we could go down, but I'm sure we'll save that for another time. Um, why don't we jump forward a few centuries to the very end of the sort of what we usually call traditional astrology, which is when we get to the 17th century. And the text of William Lilly in his book Christian Astrology, which was the first major English language textbook um, on astrology, which was giving like an introduction or a comprehensive introduction to the subject. So in Lilly, he says the nature of Saturn is that it's it's masculine, diurnal, cold and dry, melancholic, earthy, earthly, malevolent, the greater in fortune, and author of solitariness. So that's something we didn't mention is it sometimes became known as the greater malefic or the greater in fortune, whereas Mars was the lesser malefic or the lesser in fortune. So Lily says, of the people signified by Saturn, there are husbandmen, clowns, beggars, day laborers, old men, fathers, grandfathers, monks, Jesuits, sectarists, couriers, night farmers, miners underground, tinners, potters, broommen, plumbers, bricklayers, malsters, chimney sweepers, sextons of churches, bearers of dead corpses, scavengers, hostlers, colliers, carters, gardeners, ditchers, uh, chandlers, dyers of black cloth, uh, and herdsmen, shepherd or cowkeepers. Um, the manners when Saturn is well dignified in a chart is profound in imagination, severe in his acts, in words reserved, in speaking and giving very spare, in labor patient, in arguing or displaying grave, in obtaining the goods of this life studious and solicitous, in all manners of actions austere. However, the manners when Saturn is badly placed in a chart, he says, then he is envious, covetous, jealous and mistrustful, timorous, sordid, outwardly dissembling, sluggish, sus suspicious, stubborn, a condemner of women, a close liar, malicious, murmuring, never contented, and ever repining. Yeah, so that's Lily, one of the things I like about Lily, of course, once we get to this point that's a little bit implicit in earlier authors, is he's um, distinguishing between like when Saturn is well placed in a chart according to various rules of traditional astrology versus when Saturn is not as well placed in a chart based on a number of different considerations. And that's something that is relevant somewhat in terms of understanding what Saturn is going to mean, I think, in your own chart and your own life. Mm hmm. Yeah, I also um, appreciate how like Lily really. I mean, 
especially because like the bulk of his work was as a horary astrologer, right? Like answering questions, often questions that would involve other people than the person who's asking the question. Um, you know, just like this focus on like, who are the people that embody Saturn? Like, what are the tasks? Like, what are the jobs? What are the roles that are embodied by each of the planets? Um, and, you know, just really thinking about um, how some of the significations that we have already like come across from Valens and Abu Mushar and like that we've just been discussing are exemplified in some of these jobs, mm-hmm. right? Um I also find it hilarious that he attributes clowns to Saturn. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, the changing relationship with cl- clowns in like Western society. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it's also interesting, you know, so I, um, in college, I was in my university's circus and like after college, I, um, I wasn't in a circus, but I like took a lot of like aerial circus classes and stuff like that. But, um, you know, this idea of clowning, like there's the clown that's like kind of the terrifying figure at the birthday party who's just like, like, um, like it just really makes me think about how some of the funniest people are also like just really sad people. <laughs> um, but clowning in so far as a, as like a, a skill, like a performance art, um, is moving the body and like moving perception in some way in order to incite a particular response in someone. And it often includes, um, upending people's expectations of behavior um which then ties into this like saturnian concept of kind of being on the edge of being marginalized or um being reminded of what the structures and expectations of reality even are whether that be the material expectations of reality you know which we can see in capricorn or even the like the social the social or cultural interactive um, expectations of reality, which we see in Aquarius as a fixed air sign. Yeah, that's really making me think of Aquarius and thinking of an issue that came up that comes up oftentimes when it comes to like the modern late 20th century quote unquote modern astrology tendency to associate Uranus with Aquarius and some of the um, significations then that gets get attributed to Aquarius that are thought to be from Uranus about um being rebellious or being like socially outcast or other things like that but some of that actually can come from and be reframed as saturn significations that are just manifesting in a certain type of way through aquarius being like a fixed air sign mhm yeah you know it's like being able to um or to be someone whose embodiment of humanness goes against social expectations or is like butting up against the um the conceptual boundaries right like which you know the concept boundaries that to me is very aquarius you know that would then be being a weirdo being an ax an outcast being at the margins um and you know with aquarius it's like part of what's so um you know it's like uh like entertaining <laughs> i guess about aquarius is um, you know, they, they are still concerned with, um, or like, they're still a concerned with, um, like the structure of reality or like what's true, but they're like the version of what's true, the version, the perception of reality is different from the mainstream version, but they can like, I find like, uh, like my grandfather is an Aquarius and I love him extremely a lot. And he, um, it's so fun to kind of watch him get, um, like kind of upset at what he perceives to be people having no common sense, but his version of common sense is actually not as common as he thinks it is. Okay. Right. And I think that kind of like rigidity of like, this is what makes sense is Aquarian. And if that rigidity aligns with the dominant paradigm of whatever social structure you're in, great. You're just, you know, really intensely traditionalist. Um, but if that paradigm doesn't align with the social structure that you're contained within, you are a revolutionary. Right. Yeah, because that goes back to, and I'm kind of trying to quickly search for a diagram, but it was an observation originally that um, Robert Schmidt had made when he was looking at Valens' significations and some of the other significations of the planets in Hellenistic astrology that um, 
part of Saturn's core overarching conceptual role is that it was set up in the domicile scheme to be opposite to the two luminaries, where mm -hmm. it's like the sun emits light and the moon receives light from um, the signs of Leo and Cancer. But in the two signs opposite to that, Saturn is set in opposition to the two luminaries, where it excludes and it rejects things. And mm. notions of like exclusion and rejection are like these recurring Saturnian themes that come up over and over again in the traditional significations of Saturn. So the way in which that's relevant, um, <clears throat> I had a tweet over the summer actually in August during Leo season when I was thinking about this and when um, somebody said something and I, it sort of gave me a better insight into the dynamic between uh, Aquarius and Leo, but it was that um, Leo's, what I said was Leo's seek to stand out by being recognized as special and magnificent while well, Aquarius stands out by rejecting social conventions in a way that makes them unique and notable. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like two sides of the same coin, but the way that yeah. you know Saturn and Aquarius gets there is through sometimes, like you said, when you're not in the dominant like social thing by rejecting the sort mm -hmm. of dominant social consensus and therefore standing out as a result of that. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think that also, um, you know, bringing up ideas of difference. Um, and assimilatability, which is mm -hmm. not a word, but like the ability to assimilate into um, the, um, I don't know, the kind of cultural ideals versus having no interest in those cultural ideals. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that can be, um, you know, it's like, like Leo, Leo admiration is like, wow, this is the pinnacle of, you know, what a lot of people desire. Mm. Whereas like Aquarian admiration is um, this person is so themselves, like there's no way they could be anyone else and like no one else can do that. Yeah. Or, you know, to give a really like basic, uh, somewhat American like high school context, it's the mm -hmm. contrast between like the star football player uh, mm -hmm. or sort of a, a pinnacle of like a let's say a jock or something like that versus socially the um goth you know group of mm -hmm. kids that dresses in black and is perceived not just perceived but somehow in some instances stands outside of the social conventions mm -hmm. and social norms and in that way distinguishes themselves yeah yeah totally yeah i'm not sure how like re relevant that uh, analogy is going to be in like two or three centuries, or if, like <laughs> Vedas Valens would relate to that analogy, but let's just use it for the sake of contemporary astrology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe in two or three centuries, people are going to be like, they used to have casts of people called jocks <laughs> right. and yeah, yeah. another group called goths. Right. It's like, yeah, Saturn is goth. Uh, I, I do like how <laughs> like, two, two or three sources up to this point have always all said that Saturn is dressed in black and mm -hmm. have associated that as, as a recurring like Saturn theme or concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Scorpios want it. It's Saturn. Right. Yeah. People often <laughs> often overlook that or, or mix those mix those up. Yeah. All right. So um, let's see. Going back to Lily and yeah, he mm. does focus a lot on people. One thing that I'm finding that's like kind of standing out to me with um, the like manners when well dignified, profound in imagination, um, which for me feels a little surprising because I think about imagination and like imagination for me feels more like a Jupiterian and sometimes lunar um, concept. Right. Um, and but thinking about profundity as it is attached to imagination and potentially even applicability. Um, mm in terms of like what does it mean to imagine not just in a like daydreamy kind of sense or like yeah i've been reading fantasy novels only all weekend kind of way but mm -hmm. more in a sense of like i've been um you know like in the garden with my hands in the dirt like learning more about this reality and then imagining what's possible actually rooted in um what already exists if that makes any sense mm -hmm. um and I think that that is accurate. Yeah, that makes a lot mm -hmm. of sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, all right, switching back here to Lily. Um, 
we should mention because I, I need to, even though I've had lots of other episodes on it, but just briefly in passing the dignity thing, um, because it does come up and things like sect and sign-based dignity, I think, are are relevant sometimes when interpreting, for example, how a person's Saturn return might be experienced and like the spectrum of like very subjectively positive or constructive versus very subjectively challenging experiences that different people have during that time. <clears throat> So that brings up a whole cluster of concepts that is going to take a while to get into, but sect and just the difference between day and night charts, and that generally speaking, um, in ancient astrology, and I think this is still somewhat true. I found this to be true in my experience that day chart people, people that were born with day charts with the sun in the top half of the horizon, tend to experience um, Saturn as being a little bit more constructive, whereas night chart people, natives, tend to experience Saturn as being a little bit more subjectively challenging, and the inverse with the other malefic Mars, where Mars is like better in night charts and more challenging in day charts. Yeah, yeah, and that's something that I've observed in practice as well, where I feel like you know, my clients with day charts um, who either are recently out of their Saturn return or currently in their Saturn return, there's much more of a sensation of um, positive coherence that is forming um, and even like experiences of, um, I feel so much more free now than I did prior to my Saturn return, um, sort of like the unshackling experience. Um, whereas clients with night charts um, are really coming, like looking for coping strategies and survival mechanisms in order to navigate the challenges um, and the questions and the like disillusionment even that is coming up with their Saturn return. Yeah, definitely. Um, other mitigating factors for Saturn returns that I found, and a lot of these are outlined in um, Lisa Scheim and I used to write a blog titled SaturnReturnStories.com where we have some of this. And then we also did in one of the very early episodes, like episode 24 of the Astrology Podcast, uh, Lisa and I did an episode titled Understanding Your Saturn Return, where we talked about a lot of this stuff. And one of the other uh, mitigating conditions we also found in our work on Saturn Returns was just if Saturn is in one of the signs that it rules traditionally or is in the sign of its exaltation, we tended to find that people um, tended to experience their Saturn Return as a bit more constructive as well in terms of the the overall spectrum of things. So if Saturn was in Capricorn or Aquarius or Libra, there seemed to be like a, a, a qualitative difference in terms of it being experienced as a bit more constructive than if it did not have that type of sign-based dignity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's another type of thing of what Lily means when he's talking about a planet being dignified or not well dignified. And then finally, if Saturn has some nice configurations with the two benefics, like Venus and Jupiter, um, especially superior aspects where they're overcoming Saturn, that also seems to be a mitigating condition that can indicate um, the Saturn placement and things like the Saturn return being experienced a bit more constructively as well, just in terms of you know three factors that can really alter how the Saturn placement is experienced. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, should we digress and talk about the Saturn return now, or should we wait until we get more into the modern tradition before we go into that? Um, maybe let's wait, but I do just want to make a quick side note since we were just talking about dignity. If you have Saturn in one of the signs that is its antithesis or exile, like its detriment or fall, it doesn't mean that you're royally screwed by Saturn forever. <laughs> um, like it actually, it, um, depending on lots of factors, um, can actually create a situation where your awareness of an embodiment of Saturn is even more um, constructively potent than for someone who just has Saturn privilege who never does anything with it. So, Totally. That's a really, really good point. Um, I actually had a example of this that I just saw the other day. Um, I'm not sure if I can fully recall it as well as I would like right now, but one of the example charts I've always used is Dave Grohl, who mm. is like you know the drummer in Nirvana, and then he became the uh, lead singer and the the lead in the band The Foo Fighters, and um, 
I always liked his chart. There's an issue with the sect in his chart where his ascendant is at 18 degrees of Capricorn and his sun is at 24. So it's like the sun is six degrees below the horizon, but it's right at that barrier point where it starts to switch from a night chart to a day chart. So there's a question of whether he was born with a, a night chart or a day chart. Um, other people like George Lucas, who has it five or six degrees below the horizon, I feel like, and I, I've argued that it, his chart behaves more like a, um, a day chart. Um, so with Dave Grohl, I've always had that question, and I think it's been confirmed for me a little bit more recently that his chart is behaving like a day chart. Um, part of the reason for that is then with the basic distinction between sect, we would expect um, to some extent that his Mars placement in the 11th whole sign house would indicate some of his greatest challenges and difficulties and setbacks in life. And one of the things I, I noted at different times, like almost 10 years ago when they when Nirvana was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, <clears throat> one of the things that he said is that like everybody once Kurt Cobain died was like mourning for him and stuff as this great rock musician and this legendary figure. But it's like for Dave Grohl and for Chris Novoselic, they had actually lost a friend. And that was actually their primary response to what happened with Kurt Cobain is like one of their best friends killed himself in a really personal and like tragic way, mm -hmm. um, which I think is interesting in terms of Mars and the 11th house placement. But um, Dave Grohl has this new autobiography that's coming out. So he's like doing interviews and he did an interview with Howard Stern. And there's this little clip that was posted on YouTube a few days ago where he was talking about how his father was super um, his father was trained as like a classical musician, and his father was not supportive at all whatsoever of Dave Grohl's musical career. And he was actually quite skeptical that he could actually make that as a career. And he was very like dismissive and like not supportive and other things, which is very much in keeping with this like Saturn placement in a probable day chart in the fourth whole sign house. So mm -hmm. for those watching the audio version, he has Capricorn rising and Saturn and Aries in the fourth house. Square um, the ascendant really closely, really yes. closely square the ascendant. Square that ascendant and ruling the ascendant. It's, it's always been tricky for me because I don't think he comes off like a night chart Saturn also, just personality wise ruling the ascendant, but more of a day chart Saturn, but that's mm -hmm. separate issue. Um, but he did say, he, he sort of like went into it and said how once the success started happening and he got into Nirvana and then it became this like worldwide sensation very quickly that his dad suddenly was like okay with it, but he was still brought this level of like grounding him and like pessimism and saying to him, you know, this isn't gonna last, right? And Dave being like, Yeah, of course, I understand that. And so his dad said to like save every check or save every penny from every check and to not spend wildly and crazily, but to be expecting that this isn't going to last. And he said something also that his father, part of his father's issue was that he had wanted to like make it himself as a musician, but couldn't and couldn't support um, his family as a musician as he wanted so that it was like his own dreams that were never realized in that way. Wow. That's like, that's like a really like epically good, like astrologer good um <laughs> like manifestation of like a saturn in aries in the fourth like wow i mean it, it also just adds like i feel like i'm perpetually accumulating additional data that supports the traditional perspective that the fa the fourth house is the house of the father um or like the the um non-gestating parent um so yeah yeah um so yeah, just uh, I, I thought about it almost even making like a little um, video on that of doing like a commentary or something like that because I was so struck by it. But people can search for it. The title of the um, YouTube video is just uh, Dave Grohl's dad thought his music career wouldn't last more than a year. Mm. Um, so people can like search on YouTube. And it's just a little quick three minute video, but it's very instructive of what sometimes like a fourth house Saturn placement can be experienced like. Yeah, I'm looking forward to um, the analyses that might come forward after the autobiography is out. Yeah, uh, well, I ordered it. I'm really looking forward to getting it. I had some pr other previous autobiography because I think every astrologer needs to like pick 
you have your your personal charts mm -hmm. and your um obviously you know it's 50 50 and lisa and i recorded like a private podcast for patrons about this recently and it's been an ongoing not debate but ongoing topic on the podcast going way back to the beginning when i did a very early episode with kenneth miller about the value of doing celebrity charts versus personal charts of people you know mm -hmm. and you know it is really good and your own personal chart and people you know will always be your primary research topics but it's so valuable to also pick a celebrity or a few celebrities whose lives are well documented and have like biographies or autobiographies written about them where it's like you have something objective that you can point to and cite and quote like that um, to talk about that's like a public figure that where there's a shared reference point and it's really mm -hmm. clear that you're saying things that are accurate reflections of reality to some extent and it's not right. just your like subjective feeling about like your friend that you know or your opinion about their life or something like that yeah, um, something where there's fact checking that's available especially when it comes to like dates of particular events um, and things of that nature. Yeah, and it's like obviously mm -hmm. there's a subjective component also to celebrities, and there can also be things that are not true or rumors that are false, or even the celebrity themselves not saying the truth when it comes to interviews or, or their personal mm -hmm. life or other things like that. Obviously, there's issues, but it's just nice to have a balance of both, and mm -hmm. there's advantages and disadvantages to each approach. Yeah, it's like you yeah. don't get the inner life of the celebrity, but you can absolutely see the most noisy components of the outer life. And th this reminds me of one thing that um, Austin mentioned in one of his classes, it's this idea that um, celebrities can be really excellent examples because to be a celebrity to a degree um, is kind of a marker of like really, really expressing your chart. Yeah, they can sometimes be not highest expressions, but really um, literal manifestations mm -hmm. of placements that you don't always see happening in, in normal life as um, mm -hmm. clearly or as, as just like blatantly. Yeah, totally. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else from Lily before we start jumping into the modern astrological tradition? No, I'm just kind of laughing at the um, like the unnecessary dead corpses because I certainly have never experienced an alive corpse and would not like to. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's when you get into your classic zombie movie scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty sure um, zombies are Saturnian. I would say so too. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. So I think that's good for the very end of quote unquote traditional astrology. Um, let's transition into some modern astrological authors. First, starting with the early 20th century or mid 20th century German astrologer Reinhold Eberton and his book The Combination of Stellar Influences, which I chose because it was actually very influential on a lot of later uh, 20th century uh, English-speaking astrologers like Rob Hand and Richard Tarnas and Noel Till and Liz Green and lots of people like that. So um, it's both good because it's concise but also because it was influential and also at this point we see more of a turn towards Sort of psychological and character based astrology. Mm -hmm. So, did I read last time or did you? Uh, you read last time. So, I'll read this one. All right, cool. So, uh, for the principle of Saturn, we have inhibition and concentration. In terms of its psychological correspondence, on the positive side, we have concentration, consolidation, perseverance, seriousness, the ability to learn from experience, and economy. And on the negative side, we have inhibition, melancholy, reserve, and taciturnity, increasing loneliness, isolation, eccentricity, distrust, stinginess, and lack of adaptability. For biological correspondences, we have the bony structure, the process of hardening up, stone formation, the loss of organs, and old age. And for sociological correspondence, we have hardworking, inhibited, or sad people, agriculture, mining, and real estate. Nice. Talk about economy in terms of economy of words, yeah. especially compared to like Abu Mashar. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
that's a good point. And and at this point, we start getting into much more recognizable 20th century, like modern astrology and some of the modern associations that we have with astrology with Saturn, which are both um, positive and negative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's also interesting thinking about um, this organization of like positive and negative um, is like it belies a certain kind of. I don't know, prioritization, I guess. Like I wouldn't consider reserve to be a negative. <laughs> um so Yeah. Uh one of the things he I don't think he uses it here, but it makes me think a lot of these significations. Another one makes me think of is like contraction. Um, because he does say like inhibit inhibitation and concentration. Um as well as con- consolidation, but like contraction and like a, a pulling back into oneself seems to be like one of the underlying meanings here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's also interesting thinking about how in this in this structure or this approach, like as we are entering into this more psychological, like very individual approach, even though there is sociological correspondence given here, um, there's this sense that the significations provided are um really focusing on like how an individual is expressing versus how we perceive this planetary influence in the world at large so like inhibition is a negative in terms of psychology but like to inhibit is neutral otherwise Mm -hmm. right just like to stop something um and I think that's interesting as well, just to consider how um, particular concepts gain connotations depending on the co- the context that that concept is being uh, discussed within. Yeah, that's a really good point. And also focusing on like higher level archetypes here in terms of um, instead of trying to enumerate specific professions and say like this is a Saturnian profession or people that do this are Saturnian. It's almost like looking at the Saturnian ways of Saturn manifesting in any profession. So when he says like hardworking, for example, that's mm-hmm. not like a specific profession. It's like you can be a hardworking chef or a hardworking astrologer or hardworking um painter. You- painter or what whatever it's mm-hmm. just like that's the way that saturn can manifest in different ways in those professions. Mhm. I also think it's interesting because like seeing some of these things paired together like hard working inhibited or sad like mm. like I feel like there's a um guilty by association <laughs> kind of thing going on like are hard working people inhibited are hard working people sad are sad people inhibited um, and like there are some lines that can be drawn there. Um, but it's it's interesting um how I feel like with the just copiousness of the significations from some of the traditional authors, or like mm-hmm. all of the traditional authors, that right. like copious quality um doesn't really like there really isn't cross-contamination across across the concepts being presented in the same way that there is here where there's like an economy of words and then there's like an association happening at least for me right um, yeah that's a good point mm-hmm. um yeah are all farmers sad not necessarily there's <laughs> a question um mm-hmm. inhibition though and the notion of inhibition is really interesting because that can be like a Saturn theme or there can be like either areas of inhibition where a person might be more in- inhibited in a certain part of their life or a certain part of their chart you know because all of us have areas of let's say we're more inhibited inhibited about certain things versus when maybe we're less inhibited in certain areas of our life mhm yeah it's also interesting to think about the causes of inhibition hmm. um you know which of course are like infinite infinite possible causes, but thinking about inhibition as it maybe ties to um, awareness of consequences, right? Like I know, you know, for me personally, that's a factor, you know, like I don't drink that much and I've never like ever been much of a drinker. Mm. Um, And I've never had the experience of blacking out, which is like a fairly common experience among certain kinds of young people uh, who like party or whatever. Mm. 
And that for me is like an inhibitory, an inhibitory response in the sense of I know what the consequences are if I go beyond a certain point and I've just never gone beyond that point because I don't think the consequences are worth it. Mm. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, and also some people, some Saturnian people don't do that due to um, not wanting to lose control. And like it mm-hmm. sort of reminds me of one of the earlier statements, I think, in Abu Mashar of like the person not being prone to anger and being very self controlled in some sense and maybe having self control. Um, yeah, something like that. Yeah. But the consequence of losing control, like either. The fear of or the fact of like once control is lost, it's like all hell breaks loose sort right. of thing. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Let me go back here to Aberton, seriousness, perseverance. I mean, I forgot to mention my own chart, which is the one where it's finally relevant, but I'm Aquarius rising, of course, with Saturn and Scorpio exactly square the ascendant. And so a lot of the things, some of the things people like about the podcast are due to my Saturn placement. A lot of the things that people don't like about the podcast are due to my Saturn placement. Mm -hmm. I had to apologize to somebody on Reddit recently who was saying like, I can't watch his podcast because it's the most overly serious and boring thing that I've ever seen. they They were a little bit going a little bit too exaggerating it, I felt like, but I could understand how you know there's different personality types that appeal to different people, mm-hmm. and I definitely have more of a, a Saturn Saturn type personality type in some good ways and some bad ways, and how that might not sit as well as a form of like especially entertainment um, for some people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I wonder, you know, one thing that um, I've been observing. So one of my closest friends. Um, is a Leo rising. So it's not Mm. exactly opposite my ascendant, but we have, you know, it's like luminary rising versus um, Saturn rising. And, you know, one of the things that is interesting and that we will discuss with each other is um, like how much we care about whether or not other people like us. Mm. Um, Okay. And I think that, you know, depending on other factors, Saturnian folks are like, I don't really care if you like me. I care if you respect me, but I don't really care if you like me. Hmm. Um, and you know, that can then like in you know, certain ways, like looking at this like list of significations from Everton, you know, ex- eccentricity, which is a like, I don't really care what you think about me. Like we get that kind of Aquarian feeling there. Hmm. Um, and then increasing uh loneliness or isolation, like that can also be a result of um, certain kinds of just like, I don't have it in me to care about whether or not you like me, but maybe mm. it would benefit me if I did. Right? Right. right. Does that, that make makes sense? sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's see. I'm trying to think of other things. You mentioned the Leo thing. That's really funny because I'm a Leo rising magnet because I have Aquarius rising. I've always attributed to having Leo on the descendant. And so most of my, Mm -hmm. many of my closest friends just have Leo rising and it's a running gag at this point when I meet new people that also have Leo rising and just adding them to the the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, That's funny. It's like a group chat that's like one Aquarius rising and like 16 Leo (laughs) rising. Yeah, exactly. That that would be my my friend friends Mm -hmm. list. Mm-hmm. Um, including like teachers, including like Demetra and Schmidt, were both Leo rising. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and then like, like I tend pa- to- Patrick Watson and Nick Dagan Best, mm-hmm. and I just go through also the personal friend list. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's interesting. I feel like I do get a lot of Jupiterian risings, but mm-hmm. I have Jupiter in Cancer, and then my main teacher Austin is a Cancer rising. That's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, good. That's funny with a Jupiter in Cancer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. All right. So, in order to keep this moving, because I feel like I could, one of the things he mentions actually, it's really funny, is like stinginess, which is funny mm. that sometimes comes up if, for example, in the context of, um, I did this client consultation once, and this client had Saturn in the second house in a night chart. And I mentioned something about that, about like just being very careful with money. And it was funny because his wife was on the call, which I don't usually ever do. It was like a rare circumstance where I was okay doing the the client and his wife's charts, and he was like, he was like, yeah, maybe a little bit. And then his wife was like, no, you are very stingy with money, and that has been a lifelong like struggle and like issue for you because he grew up in a context during 
the Great Depression, and his family was like extremely um, poor and scraping by for years, and so that left like a permanent psychological impact on him, even if as he got o- older, and even eventually when he was able to come out of that and, and have career success of still having sort of fear surrounding second house matters of finances and things, and therefore being like overly careful and overly um, counting every penny for for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah, that's that's real, and it, it's also one of these things like um, like that's bringing up something in terms of sometimes the negative uh, manifestations of a given planetary like placement or influence. Um, they might not be perceived as negative by the person who carries that placement, but it can have negative impacts on the people around them. So like I imagine like with that particular client, um, you know, or someone in a similar circumstance, like, you know, what they perceive to be, no, this is super rational and like reasonable and logical. And like, we should be careful with our money for these reasons, but it's being received by someone else as like, you never let us have nice things. You never let us just like enjoy the fact that we have money. (laughs) Um, And, you know, that becoming like a point of contention or like that experience of stinginess, um, you know, like which this is just bringing me back to to what we were saying before of how um, malefics can indicate um, not just like, you know, yeah, you're going to be imprisoned because Saturn, whatever, but like working with an imprisoned population, um, like, the um the navigation of the consequences of those sorts of experiences um in ways that um i don't know just like like the, i guess what i'm thinking about is like the building up of responses to lived experiences and lived observations which then feel completely natural or rational, like these are very sensible outgrowths of lived experiences and lived observations, but do end up being maybe restricting of like a fuller expression of that person's like lifeness or what is actually available to them. Yeah, totally. And I think this is it goes back to one something I've always noticed when it comes to that, which is that people tend to normalize their hardships. And if they have hardships in a certain part of their life, part of an almost like coping mechanism is just assuming like, well, it's like that for everybody. Or it's like if you're um, because I, I don't want to pick on anyone in particular, but let's say if if um family and home life was difficult or or a parent left early on and you have like Saturn in the fourth and like and there's assumption that's like, well, everyone's home life must be like that. Or if relationships have been always been difficult in certain ways for you, sometimes an assumption that like, well, everyone rela- relationships are like that for everyone. When in fact, no, they're not necessarily. There's some people that might be the dem- diametrically opposite to that and have a much different experience of that. Um, that really goes back to something you and I talked about a lot on your first time on the podcast, which was in episode 258. When we talked about the title was um, "Astrology as Radical Self Care," where we were talking about the other end of that spectrum, where um, people have a tendency to normalize their positive things in life and, and to assume that that's true for everybody as well. Mm-hmm. And that actually brings up one of the things that I consider to be one of Saturn's gifts, which is like showing you reality—not just your personal reality, but your reality as it compares to other people's realities—and um, how that can then be really uncomfortable because it means having to right size your perception of yourself in your own life and your own reality in the sense, and like that can go multiple directions, right? That can be um, right sizing in the sense of like, um, wow, I have it so much worse than average. Like actually what I've gone through is like really, really actually difficult. And that can be a harrowing experience to recognize like, you know, like, no, I'm, very outside of the pale in terms of, you know, childhood adverse experiences or whatever. Um, and then coming to terms more fully with the difficulties of your life. 
But it can be really uncomfortable too to recognize like, oh, these things have been really easy for me and they are not easy for all people. Like I've had consistent access to these kinds of resources or I never have trouble with these kinds of relationships or it's really easy for me to learn this kind of thing or I have excellent health and have never broken a bone or had a surgery um, or my immune system is just naturally really good so I never get sick, right? Or um, like the sociopolitical structure that I live inside of means that I don't experience certain kinds of hardships that other people experience in the same system. And like to come to terms with that can also be really harrowing to be like, oh, I have it really good. Um, and for me, at least, I think Saturn can then incorporate this sense of like, since I have it really good, what are my responsibilities to myself and others? Right. Yeah, definitely. So, um, and I think people should uh, listen to that episode, Astrology as Radical Self-Care, that we did previously on episode 258, because even though we focused more on the benefics, it still talked a lot about that concept of privilege and the importance of, of recognizing some of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Recognizing your gifts is how you use them. Well, right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, why don't we move on to our next author, who's Stephen Forrest. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to give a shout out first. There was some commenter, and I'm like desperately searching for his name, but somebody I'm not finding it on YouTube or on in my email. So maybe it was on Twitter. But somebody told me that um, I thought Stephen Forrest's book came out in 1988, but it turns out that that's like some later edition I have, and it was actually mm. published in 1984. Oh, so. Wow quick little correction for that just for the sake of history. And <clears throat> I should also mention that I've been taking an excerpt out of this from Stephen Forrest, but unlike the other authors where that excerpt was like the entire section on that planet, Stephen has this little section at the beginning, but then he has like a full discussion of the planet. So I'm actually kind of like cherry picking just a piece of that. So people, if they like this excerpt, should actually read the full book and chapter for his actual deep dive into what the planet means. So Stephen Forrest, The Inner Sky, 1984, he says, the function of Saturn is the development of self-discipline, the development of self-respect, the development of faith in one's destiny, making peace with solitude. Its dysfunction is, or can be, depression, melancholy, cynicism, coldness, unresponsiveness, time-serving, drudgery, lack of imagination, suppression of emotion, materialism. The key questions for Saturn, especially in your birth chart, are, in what area of life must I learn to act alone? Where will a lack of self-discipline lead most quickly to sorrow? Where will my ability to dream and have faith be most severely tested? And then he says, when retrograde, Saturn indicates deeply rooted self-sufficiency, may indicate a quote-unquote loner, enormous reserves of inner strength, emotional self-discipline, and may have a hard time saying no. So that is Stephen Forrest, and this is once this is when we get into the most the more familiar forms of sort of like late 20th century astrology, which is more psychological, more character-based. Um, but also talking about some like broader questions when it comes to astrology and broader implications of certain chart placements. Mm -hmm. So the one thing that was really standing out to me, like the development of faith in one's destiny, and it's just reminding me of like the concept of amor fati, like to to love one's fate, which fate and destiny are not the same. Um, but there's this this similar idea of um, like recognizing recognizing what's real, recognizing what's given, and not suffering over it, but instead choosing um, choosing to make the most of it. Like I won't say make the best of it because I don't think this is about bestness, but about like what um, like given the materials you're working with, like what can you make? Yeah, right? yeah, what can you make? And also, Accepting what is the there's like a is it called the Lord's Prayer or something? It's like give me the strength to accept. Oh, the ser Serenity Prayer. Serenity par Prayer. What is it again? Mm -hmm. The prayer. Do you know? Um, Lord, give me this. Oh man, I'm gonna have to look it up because okay. I always get it wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's it's classic. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. 
Right. Yeah. That that to me has always been part of the idea of amor fati and loving your fate is um, partially an acceptance of that which you cannot change and coming to peace with it and being okay with it. And that was very much, you know, going back to ancient astrology was part of the the Stoic background of like Greco Roman astrology and some of the astrologers like Vadius Valens was they believed the purpose, the primary purpose of astrology was to find out what your fate was so that you knew what you had to accept in your life ahead of time and you could prepare yourself for the future so that you could accept it calmly and not be thrown off completely um, by things that come up unexpectedly in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like the like the extension of that, like moving like beyond that, and I think that that's part of what Forrest is doing here is like it's not just um, coming into acceptance of that which you cannot change, but um, like coming into belief in that which you can make. Like like I like that's one of the ways I differentiate destiny and fate. Like destiny isn't guaranteed; you have to work towards destiny. Fate is what's presented, right? Destiny is kind of what's possible. Um, and like other people probably will disagree with me philosophically in terms of defining those words, but that's that's how I've come to define them. And so it's like if destiny requires your participation, then knowing what is fated allows you to discern what's fate and what's what's destiny. Like where do you have agency? Where can you um, cultivate mastery, not just in terms of mastery of acceptance um, and acknowledgement, but mastery of creation mm, right. or participation. Yeah. And that is one of the trickiest things with astrology sometimes is figuring out what are the things that are um, what are the things that are off the table to you versus in your life versus what are some of the things that are on the table and just require mm-hmm. a tremendous amount of work, but that you could achieve if you just put your mind to it and if you work hard because yeah. both of those are different aspects of saturn basically yeah yeah totally and this is actually reminding me of a book that i wanted to make sure we mentioned um because it was a book that i read and like you know really sat with at the very beginning of my own saturn return um but Svoboda's the greatness of saturn yeah um which is just it's kind of harrowing it's intense. It's really harrowing as a read. Um, and I like it was mentioned in like an early podcast episode without that warning. And I think a lot of people like walked in, you know, not knowing what they're getting into. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um, like content warnings all over the place, especially in terms of just like harm and uh, disability and <laughs> yeah. uh, extreme falls from grace, maybe. Um, but uh, where was I going with this? It's the greatness of Saturn. Greatness of Saturn, books on Saturn, and um, accepting I mean that, one's fate, accepting accepting what your is, reality and accepting your mm-hmm. limitations, accepting that which is not available to you anymore. Um, yeah. Oh, but also just like the like sometimes the the lesson of Saturn is like you do the work to do the work. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, part of the process is like, maybe this is never possible for me, but you still like, if it's something that you feel like that it, you're obliged to do, you just do it anyway. Um, And like the, yeah, just like something about how, um, you know, Saturn's, <sighs> I mean, I guess like this, this even brings up like Forrest's question of where will my ability to dream and have faith be most severely tested? Like, yeah. can you continue to work on something even if it seems ill fated or unlikely? Um, or, you know, you've gotten yourself into a decision where you maybe you don't believe in that possibility anymore, but like you continue walking forward, which then brings up this concept of like the dark night of the soul, um, which for me, I think is absolutely a Saturnian experience, just like this utter absence of indicators that you are moving in the right direction, this utter absence of um, whatever you have been holding onto as like a a grounding force um, or even a propulsive force, just this utter vac- like evacuation, just like utter elimination, this utter loss of that which um, has up until that point been 
an immense source of inspiration and motivation and things like that. But then to continue to choose to like just keep walking forward, even when it seems like there is no forward, like that's the test of the dark night. Right. Right. And yeah. not everybody gets a dark night of the soul in their Saturn return. Like, don't freak out. Um, yeah. And I can't but, remember was the dark, was the um, greatness of Saturn, was that about the Sati Sati transit? Because that was like written in the context of Indian astrology. And I can't remember mm-hmm. if that was supposed to be what the character in this, it was because it, it's a yeah. fiction. It's like a fiction or it's like a legend. I think it's a sati sati because of how long like the the main character endures his ordeal. Right. Um is much longer than the time of the of the Saturn return. It's like it's like a seven years or like one of those longer longer time periods. Yeah. And for those that don't know, Sati Sati is like an Indian concept when Saturn is transiting the moon and Mm -hmm. both the moon sign, but it also starts in the sign before the moon and extends to the sign after the moon. So it ends up being Mm -hmm. kind of a long period. I did in episode 135, I did an episode on Sati Sati. So people can check that out. It's just titled um, Sati Sati Saturn Transiting the Natal Moon that I did Mm -hmm. in 2017 with Ryan Kurzak. Yeah. And that's interesting whenever your Sati Sati happens to coincide with your Saturn return as mine did. Oh, interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's fun. Good times. Yeah. That was yeah. great. Yeah. Pluto, Pluto also just like demolishing my first house. That's awesome. Nice. Yeah. You got the whole Capricorn pileup last year. Uh huh. Yeah. With the South Node also. It okay. Was amazing. Yeah. That's fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting some of that. I'm getting some of that right now with the Aquarius mm-hmm. rising and my moon in Aquarius. So, so that's me right now. Um, okay. So one of the things though you're mentioning, I want to go back. Finality is a concept that came up. Limitations. It's making me think of houses and some of the things you were saying and some house placements. Like so for example, I've seen. Um, I think it was like a client placement or something where it was like Saturn in the fifth house and the native wanted to have children, but found out that she was infertile and couldn't have children. And it ended up becoming a question of whether that was then a roadblock and not to proceed further, or if she would end up having children through some other means. And I've I've seen different people go different ways with that. Um, Yeah, depending on that or. There's similar things when it comes to, um, let's say, relationships. And if a person can't has trouble forming relationships or loses a marriage partner or something like that, and then the struggle becomes like how to proceed after that roadblock is encountered. Or let's say a tenth house thing of person has, has a career aspiration, but there's some sort of roadblock that comes up, and then the question of whether that's a finality type roadblock of cannot proceed further in this career or if it becomes something where they have to expend a great deal of energy to overcome it and then in the end they're able to succeed in some way. Mhm. Yeah, and it's like those those ordeals. I mean, thinking about the idea of ordeal, I think can be useful with Saturn um of being put through an experience that um alters you in some significant way. Like this is just reminding me of, you know, if we don't use the um like Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, what planets get those um those significations instead? And I would say that Pluto and Saturn have a lot in common in terms of like putting three people putting people through experiences that radically alter um their personalities, their bodies, um, how they perceive the world, how they orient towards their futures, um, their values. Um, their priorities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and sometimes the ordeal is just like, this is no longer an option. And sometimes the ordeal is you can't do it the easy way, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. Right. Yeah. Or sometimes you can't do it as much as you used to. There's a reduction, or sometimes it brings in the component of like time or age of. Realizing getting older, I mean, <clears throat> my uh, Saturn transit as soon as, of course, Saturn first dipped into Aquarius last year was like the Mars Saturn conjunction happening at the beginning of Aquarius, getting COVID, and then Saturn going through my first house over the past year and suffering from lingering 
fatigue and tiredness and slowness and other things that are still as a result of that. And then realizing now that I have longer or bigger limitations than I used to have in terms of my ability to expend energy and needing to um, take more time at things and do things more slowly. So that's been an interesting, like very literal, like first house Saturn transit um, to give a sort of correlation with some of the things you were talking about, and also in terms of the more abstract examples I was using for like the seventh house and fifth house. Yeah, totally. I mean, and for me, like the Saturn Pluto conjunction happened within a degree of my Venus, and Venus rules my midheaven. Um, and so it's like 2020 was a year of like immense physical exhaustion and like health concerns that have definitely curtailed, like definitely con- curtailed how much I thought I was going to do in 2020 and continues to, you know, it's like the, um, the amount of like Venusian, like everybody have the things, like everybody have a nice time. I just can't, it's not available anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and you know, some of the things we were talking about are like natal placements, and others that we're talking about now more are like temporary, you know, transits because just there are times in our life where we go through more dark note of the soul periods, or maybe sometimes that's just limited to a certain part of our life, or other times it becomes more of a overarching like umbrella thing that's applying to the life in general. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think like sometimes that can lead to um, more sustainable approaches, like things that have greater endurance. Um, you know, like almost transitioning away from like the rapidity of Mars to the slowness of Saturn. But at least in theory, like whatever, not whatever, but like some of the time that means creating things that are more durable and more enduring. Um, than what you would have been producing had you not had the experience that requ- necess- necessitated slowing down, pruning, um, readjusting in some way. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right. Is there anything else we should mention related to Stephen Forrest before we move on to our final author, which is Steve, uh, which is Richard Tarnas? Um. He says coldness. I like that he said coldness because he says it in a psychological context, um, mm-hmm. like unnecessary, like getting the cold shoulder or being, let's say, cold to your spouse or something like that. Right, or being brusque, right? Like shutting, shutting down in some way. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Which, like, coldness and suppression of emotion, I think, also go together in cynicism mm. in interesting ways. Definitely. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's go to Tarnas, where I really like Tarnas because he like brings everything up and wraps it all up with a nice comprehensive like bow at the end of the tradition where he draws on some modern and some ancient stuff, which tends to go pretty well. Um, is it my turn or your turn? I think it's my turn. Okay. Yeah. Go for okay. it. Okay. So Saturn is the principle of limit, structure, contraction, constraint, necessity, hard materiality, concrete manifestation, time, the past, tradition, age, maturity, mortality, the endings of things, gravity and gravitas, weightliness, that which burdens, binds, challenges, fortifies, deepens, the tendency to confine and constrict to separate, to divide and define, to cut and shorten, to negate and oppose, to strengthen and forge through tension and resistance, to rigidify, to repress, to maintain a conservative and strict authority, to experience difficulty, decline, deprivation, defect and deficit, defeat, failure, loss, alienation, the labor of existence, suffering, old age, death, The weight of the past, the workings of fate, character, karma, the consequences of past action, error and guilt, punishment, retribution, imprisonment, the sense of no exit, pessimism, inferiority, inhibition, isolation, oppression and depression, the impulse and capacity for discipline and duty, order, solitude, concentration, conciseness, thoroughness and precision, discrimination and objectivity, 
restraint and patience, endurance, responsibility, seriousness, authority, wisdom, the harvest of time, effort, and experience, the concern with consensus reality, factual correctness, conventional forms and structures, foundations, boundaries, solidity and stability, security and control, rational organization, efficiency, law, right and wrong, judgment, the superego, the dark, cold, heavy, dense, dry, old, slow, distant, the senex, Kronos, the stern father of the gods. Damn, that's really good. Um, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Like we could have just like read we that just, at the beginning, like, read and been like, "All right, that's the all right." Episode. Let's call it a day. That's that would have been a five-minute episode. Um, yeah, yeah. And I always I struggle with that because I could have just started from the modern authors and worked backwards. I didn't think it I like sense. going the other direction. I think starting starting at the relative beginning is, I don't know. Appropriately Saturnian, but also yeah. like invites people to like observe how things have cha- changed over time. Yeah, and it gives so much more context than an understanding of why he narrows zeroes in on this collection of both sometimes very literal and other times very more psychological themes and archetypes, mm-hmm. basically. But you get it; you kind of get it all here in his quote. I feel like. Yeah, that's great. It's also interesting. Like one of the things I was noticing is like conciseness, thoroughness, and precision. Excuse me, where it's like the most concise, but also most thorough. Like right. literally, that's what he just did. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. And also mm-hmm. his sort of like alliteration is what it is, where he's like mm-hmm. difficult difficulty, decline, deprivation, defect, and deficit, and defeat. I, I like yeah. that. I I I I love I love that as a poetically minded person I love that so much. Yeah, it's kind of like the Mercury retrograde, like rewords, like rework, mm-hmm. return, remember, etc. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, he even does it with like resistance, rigidify, repress. Right. Um, there's, I think there's, like one of the things that's coming up with Tarnas that I think even brings us back into like discussions of things like Saturn returns. Um, there's something in how like Tarnas writes, you know, even with his like massive generosity of 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 writing, there's like certain rhythms with how he writes. And like rhythm is another way to think about time. Um, and you know, Saturn's rhythm is at this, you know. 28, 29, 30 year cycle around the zodiac. Um, and like that rhythm demarcates like a like a waltz in a life, right? Like the like the one, two, three, where it's like we have the first area of life from like zero to thirty, the next era from thirty to sixty, the next era from sixty to ninety. And if you're lucky, you might get behind like beyond ninety, but like low chances you're gonna make it to 120, right? So like that kind of um, like one, two, three waltz that um, Saturn Saturn has is um, I think really fascinating to consider whenever we also think about like the develop the development of a story, right? Like the beginning, middle, end, um, like the. Um, the process of figuring out a problem, like identifying the problem, identifying the solution, fixing it. Like there are all of these like tripartite things that um, we can see in a life and we can see that reflected in aspects of like the Saturn, like the Saturn cycle or like the Saturn definition. Like even thinking about like Saturn as like spends like three-ish years in a sign, right? Like there's a lot of give or take, but just like this, that rhythm, but it's at like a very large scale. And then it's reflected in the rhythm of like the lunar cycle, which is like the fastest moving object that we consider a planet in astrology, which, you know, has the same like waxing, like, you know, waxing full dark, right? Like there's this, um, you know, there are different ways that people have thought about the moon in parts of three, but also just like the, you know, 28 ish days around the zodiac which then get reflected in things like, you know, this is like kind of getting into the weeds, but, 
you know, thinking about how the progressed lunar cycle dances with the Saturn return cycle as well, where it's like the progressed lunar return, which, you know, um, Stephen Forrest talked about it at UAC 2018 as like the emotional training ground for the Saturn return, right? And like at the second Saturn return, they happen closer together in time. Um, and I don't know, it's just, I can, I could go off on like, <laughs> like an ongoing tangent, but. That's a really good point. So the secondary progressed, um, you have a secondary progressed new moon where or the lunar return, lunar return. So the secondary progressed moon will return back to its natal position approximately every 28 years, right? Mm -hmm. And the Saturn return also occurs roughly every about 28 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like the, the progressed lunar return is more like 27 ish, right? Like 27 and a half. Um, and so, like for some people, it will co occur with like the Saturn return period and the sense of like Saturn re entering the sign of its natal position. And for some people, it just happens before Saturn even gets into the, gets back into the natal sign. Um, but either way, you know, it's like whatever. There's a whole cluster of astrological events at the end of the 20s that contribute to the, the um, you know, the clusterfuck of the 20s. Right. Um, or they, they culminate in, yeah. That culminate in the, in the late 20s. Right. Um, to bring back and, our, our alliteration. Yeah. Um, and that's, it's just, um, I don't know. I really, I really love thinking about the dance between the moon and Saturn in terms of like how we mark off time, how we mark off eras how we go through different experiences of like growth and decay and maturation and mm -hmm. all of that kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, and it's interesting that the two of their domiciles are opposite to each other with Cancer mm -hmm. and Capricorn. Um, so, we don't need to dwell on it, but just mentioning the Saturn return that it returns back to its natal sign between the ages of 27 and 30. And that's Roughly the Saturn return, and then its return back to the exact degree is the exact Saturn return when it's at its most intense. And it's been really fascinating, not just going over through my own Saturn return, but then successively over the past few years, seeing other astrologers going through mm -hmm. their Saturn returns and seeing how that's worked out as that final entrance into adulthood and into your 30s. Mm -hmm. um, that it's often described as, but it's like one thing to like read that abstractly and see how it works in other people's charts, and it's quite a different thing to actually like live through it yourself. Yeah, and I actually have like I'll go ahead and share my Saturn return story um, because I think it's really funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, um, for a long time, for like the majority, I mean, yeah, the majority of the time that I've been studying astrology, I thought that I was a Sagittarius rising. Oh, no. um, <laughs> That's such oh, an no. astrologer Saturn return story. Yeah. Um, and so at the beginning of my Saturn return, I thought I was having a second house Saturn return. Um, and a few months after Saturn entered Capricorn, I was um, looking for my voter registration card for like a, like a municipal voting thing hmm. and ended up finding a notarized copy of my birth certificate that my grandmother had sent me and I'd forgotten about. And my birth time was 10 minutes later than the one that my mom had told me. And it pushed my ascendant into Capricorn. Wow. And so the first major event of my Saturn return was realizing I was having a first house Saturn return and it involved a complete recontextualization of my self-understanding through the lens of astrology. Beautiful. That's very, very literal, very self referential. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, you can't you can't beat that. Yeah. Um so Yeah. And then you've and, seen a bunch of your fellow other other people go through their Saturn returns recently mm -hmm. as well, right? Yeah. And it's it's really um I think it's one of these things where when you're pre-Saturn return, it feels really condescending when people are like, you just wait till you're on the other side of your Saturn return. And you go through your Saturn return, and you're like, oh. Right. Yeah. You're like, oh, that's what they meant. And I couldn't I, have actually understood that conceptually until I experienced it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that Saturn carries, right? Is like learning through experience, um, which, who was it? Was it Everton that was saying 
learning through experience. Yeah, the ability to learn from experience um, was one of Everton's things. And it's not just the ability, but it's also the fact of there are certain things that you just do not learn until you have done them or until you've passed through them. And there are certain things that you cannot do or learn until you're old enough to do or learn the thing. So like the idea that's coming to mind right now is like walking, like you're not born able to walk. You're born with the potential to grow into like a bipedal mammal. (laughs) Um, But you start off not being able to really move at all. And then you learn how to crawl and then you learn how to stand. And then some people just start running before they actually figure out walking. Um, but there's a, there's a time-based process and, you know, there's some things that you just, you can't talk about, you can't actually know until you've walked through the experience or like passed through the experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I liked yours because yours with the first house, the first house, one of its primary overarching meanings that crosses all boundaries is just that the first house signifies self. And but what that means is such a amorphous thing until you go through a major transit of the first house and you you realize what that means in a very concrete way, like some sort of change to your sense of self and selfhood. And, and for you, it was like a you know your birth time changed and turn your rising sign changed, and you had to readjust your entire perception of who you were and what your life was, uh, you know, based on astrology. And it felt so much better because like I have things in Sagittarius already and I was like, I'm also a sad rising. Am I that extra? I don't think I'm this extra. Like no shade to sad risings. I love sad risings. Um, but yeah, like one of the ways that I've described it in the past is it was like taking off a sweater that I didn't realize was slightly too small and itchy. Right. And just like that relief of like, oh, my skin feels so much better and I can like breathe in a more comfortable fashion. Um, Yeah, I'm absolutely not a sad rising. Yeah, you literally like found yourself during your sad return in the first house and found out more about who you actually are in some on some level. Yeah, and like not just finding out like, oh, interesting fact about who I am, but like literally being able to embody it in the first house being attached to our embodiment of being incarnated, you know, like the actual carnation part. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, that's brilliant. I did want to mention very briefly in passing the Saturn return is the closing of one, the first 30 year sort of period or chapter of your life. And sometimes there's a sense of like ending and reflecting on everything that built up to that point, but it's also laying the foundations during that three year period of the Saturn return to its natal sign, laying the foundations for the next 30 years. And it's often then really interesting to see how the subsequent Saturn cycle, especially the hard aspects like the two squares and the opposition, refer back to things that were initiated at the Saturn return itself and um, further developments or key turning points in the development of that story. So there's like the opening waxing square that occurs. Seven years after the Saturn return, and then there's the opposition that's like 14 years later, and then there's the waning square, which occurs uh, whatever 21 years later before you hit the second Saturn return, which happens in your what your like late late 50s. Yeah, late 50s, early 60s. Yeah, so you know we talk a lot about the Saturn placement by sign and by house and what house Saturn is placed in, but it's also interesting to look at the dynamic between those other three houses that it transits through and will make hard aspects back to its natal position, because you'll often see those really tied in with the overall story um, of the Saturn placement and the Saturn return. Yeah, it's, it's also interesting to think about how the Saturn cycle helps to create a personal and embodied experience of the inherent um, like square nature of whatever modality your Saturn is in, right? Um, so like if you have a cardinal Saturn, then all of your like your cardinal, like all of your squares and oppositions are going to be um, an experience. Oh, this is perfect. Yeah, I have a um, diagram for that. <laughs> I love this. 
then like all of that is going to be an experience of like the interactions between the cardinal signs, like, you know, how they all have the same method of movement, but they have different core concerns around how and why they're moving. So being able to think like, okay, how does, how does like cancer's concerns support or argue with Libra's concerns? Um, you know, and like to have that be a, a thematic way to describe um, your own experience of your own natal Saturn yeah, over time to- as it totally. unfolds. Mm-hmm. Um, and also looking at it in terms of the house placement, because um, what will happen is like if a person has their Saturn in the fifth house, then it, like natally, and they have their Saturn return, then like fifth house topics related to things like children, creativity. Um, pleasure, sex can come up during their Saturn return, but also um, sometimes those other three houses, like the second house of financial matters and your possessions, the eighth house of like mortality or other people's possessions or debt, and the eleventh house of like friends and groups and things like that. Those topics can come up um, at the same time, or if you know the person has their Saturn in the like the fourth house. Um, home and family and like private life, but then also the other houses that are making hard aspects to that of the seventh house of relationships, tenth house of career, and first house of self and body. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so the Saturn placement is somehow very closely tied in with not its not just its natal house and natal sign, but also the other signs or houses tied in with that quadruplicity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and it's something that. Doesn't sometimes become fully clear until you like then go through the subsequent Saturn cycle and see Saturn go through those houses and those topics um, come up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. that but that's a that's a story for another time. Um, Lisa and I did some stories on that on the Saturn return stories, and I think may have talked about it a little bit more in that episode on the Saturn return. That's not on YouTube, but it is on the Astrology Podcast website somewhere. If you search for the early. Episode on Saturn returns, which was like uh, episode twenty-four. Mm-hmm. All right, where are we at at the, this point in our our marathon discussion of like three-ish hours on Saturn, <laughs> Saturn returns? Three and a half hours on Saturn returns. Would you include the breaks? Like, yeah, Saturn and Saturn returns. I think it's really funny that this is probably going to be the longest. Right, or might be the longest episode. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was an inversion with the Jupiter, with the Jupiter episode. Jupiter was shortest, mm-hmm. Saturn was longest. We are flipping the script, script uh, sort of metaphorically on the planets. Yeah, I, mean, I think we've we've covered a lot. Obviously, um, you know, one thing that uh, we were maybe going to bring up that I think you know we've already kind of touched on in terms of like the Saturn return cycle and then the Saturn return cycle as it dances with the progressed lunar cycle. Um, is thinking about like Saturn as it figures into um, astrological technique. Um, and so just thinking about how Saturn is in charge of time itself and the concept of time lords, like chronicators, chronos, right? Like being connected to Saturn. Like we can think of all time lord techniques as some level of Saturnian in terms of like demarcating, like putting boundaries around chunks of time <laughs> um, by like planetary planetary association. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and, and your point that astrology itself, so astrology is to some extent a very Saturnian thing because it um, focuses so much on time and the study of time and the different qualities of time. Yeah, yeah, and like not just the different qualities of time, but also being able to mark out like certain time periods to be able to say this kind of experience um, or this quality of time will last this long, will endure this long, um, and then how that facilitates um, an interaction with time and experience that um, can allow for greater acceptance and then greater. Um, Greater self mastery and potentially greater mastery in terms of interacting with the world based on um, information that uh, clarifies aspects of reality. Mm, right. So, yeah, it makes me think of uh, one of the other terms for time lords when Valen starts talking about is the other phrase is um, the division of the times, mm. and so he talked about the different time lord techniques as being the techniques that divide the times, which mm-hmm. is also kind of a Saturn thing of of the 
the different boundaries and the demarcations of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Saturn's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm pro, we're very pro Saturn on this show, I think, yeah. um, mm -hmm. in general, on the podcast in general. I think we, we got off to a little rocky start with Valens not being as pro Saturn in his mm -hmm. initial statements, but hopefully we've been able to provide more of a well rounded understanding of some of the broader archetypal themes that come up when it comes to Saturn. Yeah. Respect yeah. Saturn. Respect. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Um, is there anything else we need to mention that we're gonna kick ourselves for? Like sometimes at this stage, like in the Mars episode, which may have been the longest up to this point with Sylvie, I after we'd done the entire marathon of going through all the things, I tried to cram in like, okay, now let's go through planetary combinations with Mars and other planets. Uh. <laughs> I feel like we're running a, a little long and we might mm -hmm. have to respect Saturn in having some some boundaries and some um, you know, restrictions when it comes to time yeah. here. I mean, so the only thing that comes up there is like, I always like to remind people like Saturn is exalted in Libra. And sometimes people are like, Libra, like Venus and Saturn, like there's some confusion there. And one of the, one of the, for me, one of the like pinnacles of um, like Saturn Venus expression is something like ballet, where it is beautiful. It is like, like its point is aesthetic. Like it doesn't have, um, like a like a necessity component like ballet is not necessary in the way that like water <laughs> is necessary but in order to become like an incredible ballet dancer one must put in massive amounts of time for a long time highly disciplined there's very specific like even structural requirements for being a ballet dancer like if you're ankles are set up in a particular way and you can never go on point you will never be a prima ballerina like doesn't matter how bad you want it just no um and um like to become like a master of ballet it's just it's such a saturnian effort in order to create a venusian experience you know there's like a lot of pain like that ballet dancers go through in order to achieve the heights of their craft and then Additionally interesting is like the lifespan of a ballet career isn't very long. Like there aren't very many professional ballet dancers who are still dancing after their opening Saturn Square, after their first Saturn return. Yeah, I watched actually on the recommendation of a friend, uh, uh, like a movie that was like a it was a drama, but it was titled Birds of Paradise. It was like an Amazon Prime movie, but it was actually like really good. Like I feel like Amazon. Is killing it with some of their movies and scripts that they're funding these days for their service and trying to compete with Netflix. Anyways, that's a really good example of that because it's like a movie about a group of ballerinas that are in Paris and they're all competing for and trying to be the single person that will win um, the the prize at the end of the movie, which is getting like a contract with the Paris uh, Opera or Par Paris Ballet. And just the level of like commitment and like blood and sweat and tears that go into trying to be the best, and the different things that go into that in terms of um, yeah, some of the things you were saying. Yeah, it's really intense. It's really right. really intense. Um, but I I just like to remind people that Venus and Saturn, like some of the most incredible Venusian productions, require Saturnian effort. Yeah. Of of discipline and mm -hmm. um, precision and skill and dedication and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Devotion, even. Yeah, that's a really good mm -hmm. point. Um, all right. Well, then I won't make us uh, go through other planetary combinations. I'll save that for later. Um, mm -hmm. I did want to rattle off. I I got most of like references to most of the other episodes where we've dealt with Saturn in. The only other ones that I didn't mention is. If you do a search for the significations of the seven traditional planets, this was me and Austin and Kelly doing a take. There's a little bit of a take on Saturn there. Um, we did the Saturn return episodes. One of them was episode 131 titled Saturn Return in Sagittarius Retrospective, which was a great retrospective on people that had their Saturn return when it went through Sagittarius a few years back. And there was an even better one, which is episode uh, 283, which Lisa and I did last December, I think. Which is titled Saturn Return in Capricorn Retrospective, where we got a bunch of listener and some celebrity charts that we've been watching of people that went through their Saturn return when Saturn was in Capricorn and 
kind of outline some of our principles for SATA returns. So people should check those out for more about that that whole technique and concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see, and I think that's pretty much it in terms of referring to those. Um, oh no! You also like the astrological generation, Saturn signs of millennials. We haven't mentioned that one either. Yes, that was that an was amazing... episode two seventy five. Right. Um, yeah, I wrote that down two seventy five with Kira, and that was also a great episode. We focused in particular on um, millennials, but that was a great discussion because it's something I'd been meaning to do more, and that was the first time really touching on it. Just the demarcation between generations of people. Um, based on their Saturn sign, which is a super mm-hmm. fascinating study, and which Kira has done like a really good job on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I think those are all of the ones I meant to write down. Um, as for you and your work when it comes to Saturn, other things related to Saturn, consultations or other content, um, where can people find out more about your work, or what are some of your offerings? Yeah, so. Um- one thing is I actually just did a talk on um, Saturn and the concept of no, and no as a liberatory word for the Fresh Voices and Astrology Summit. Um, and I'm having uh, like a professional transcriptor person um, do the transcription so that way it's like super accessible for a multitude of people. Um, and so that will be up and available for purchase on my website sometime in the next like month or two. Um, and then beyond that, like people can find me on uh, my website, Twitter, Patreon, Instagram. I'm taking a Twitter break right this second. Um, and all of those places, um, the word to know is Damashena, and that's spelled D D A M A S C E N A A. So you put an at in front of that, and you find me on the social mediums. Um, and you go to damashena.com and you find my website. Awesome. Yeah. There's your website. I'll put a link to that also in the either the description below this video for people on YouTube or on the podcast website for those listening to the audio version. Yeah. Wonderful. Cool. And you mentioned no. That's funny that we didn't talk about that. That's, that's such a great Saturn word is no, mm-hmm. which sometimes as part of its exclusion and rejection thing can be a not pleasant thing if if you get a no, like you get a no from a job, or you get fired from a job, or you get a no from a relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, but other times there can be positive expressions of of no. Yeah, I mean, and without no, there can't be yes, right? And so it's it's a similar idea to like without death, there can't be life. Um, so yeah, that's perfect. All right, and where again can people get that talk? Um, so if you happened to get an all access pass from Fresh Voices in Astrology, hopefully you downloaded your recordings. The, okay. the, that all access pass, as far as I'm aware, is no longer available. Mm-hmm. Um, and otherwise, I will have it up for sale on my website um, as soon as the tr- transcription is finished. Brilliant. All right. So, yeah, definitely. And especially if people are listening to this far into the future, then, then go to your website to get it. Yeah. Uh huh. Cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot for joining me for this episode and for helping me to complete the very last of the seven traditional planets and and mm-hmm. nearly complete my entire planetary series because I've done Uranus. I've already recorded Neptune and I'm re- waiting to release that probably next. And all that I have left to do is is Pluto. So thanks for helping to round this out and bring some sense of completion and finality to this this series on the planets. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, it's like as I've said before, and we'll say again, I could talk about Saturn forever. Um, okay, but thankfully Saturn puts like a cap, <laughs> right? A cap on things. So really, like, thank you so much for um, geeking out about, um, like, honestly, like the planet that I feel like the I have the greatest um, affinity for and understanding of. So, mm-hmm. like, thank you for chatting, chatting about Saturn with me and having having me on. Yeah. yeah, it was a pleasure. Um, so um, yeah, thanks again for joining me. Uh, people, be sure to check out your website in the links below. And I guess that's it for this episode of the Astrology Podcast. So thanks a lot for listening or for watching, and we'll see you again next time. Bye. Special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Nate Craddock, Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, 
Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, Kristen Otero, and Sanjay Srihari. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. If you would like to learn more about the approach to astrology that I outline on the podcast, then you should check out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune where I traced the origins of Western astrology and reconstructed the original system that was developed about 2,000 years ago. And in this book, I outline basic concepts, but also take you into intermediate and advanced techniques for reading a birth chart, including some timing techniques. So you can find out more about the book at hellenisticastrology.com book. The book pairs very well with my online course on ancient astrology called the Hellenistic Astrology Course, which has over 100 hours of video lectures where I go into detail about teaching you how to read a birth chart and showing hundreds of example charts in order to really demonstrate how the techniques work in practice. So find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. And finally, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com, the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, the Portland School of Astrology at portlandastrology.org, and the AstroGold Astrology app, which is available for iPhone and Android. You can find out more information about that at astrogold.io.